Okay. I'll just make a small introduction, Atlas, and then we just rock and roll, yeah? This will have absolutely no structure at all. You're already visible on the screen. Uh, this is the lowest production quality shit ever. But I bring cool guests, as everyone can see. This is the voice of Atlas. So usually this show is called The Voice of Yamaru, but since we have a guest, it's The Voice of Atlas. And I think it's oh, shit. Uh, aptly named because you cast. And um, all in all, today we're just going to have a conversation. Uh, I met Atlas for the first time at IWCA. Uh, was it 2016 or 17? 2016. 2016. 2016. 2016. This was when you were already an old man, as I thought at the beginning of that event. <laughs> this this yeah. event was 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 brilliant. Atlas and uh, the rest of the squad they were uh, such uh, gracious hosts. I was having fun every day. I didn't think about spiders or dingo babies at all. I felt safe. <laughs> I was distracted permanently. So it was uh, truly one of the best memories that uh, I've. Uh, ever been uh, honored to participate in well i guess i participate in all of my memories but you get my point I, it's a very <laughs> yeah. good memory of mine it's uh, good to have you on the show atlas how you've been doing uh, thank you so much weeks. for having me I, i've uh, i've been good i've been good i've been doing my best to sort of take a bit of a break mm -hmm. i generally do this before every msi where i take like a month of my time because lck generally finishes before a lot of the other regions i use it as like a reset time it also means that all of my League of Legends knowledge stays on the patch that was <laughs> for the LCK final, right? And then I get to do like the full cram session. So I have all of the new things that have happened in my brain right as MSI starts. That's, that's been my strategy for the last, what, fucking eight years or something like that? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm old. Anyway, it's been my strategy since 2015 MSI. And it seems to have worked thus far. I did miss one. So I guess it's only seven, but still, um, yeah, it's been very, very good. I've been back with the family. Um, my fiance actually lives about two hours out of Seoul. So okay. I've done a bit of traveling back and forth. She's got the cats at the moment. Um, so I need to make sure that I visit the children as well. Otherwise I get <laughs> sad and lonely. Um, so I've been doing a bit of that, had some, uh, delicious dinners and things like this and otherwise basically just chilling man it's uh it's been really good i'm glad that you brought up where we first met the iwca mm. i had forgotten that that was even the name of the tournament <laughs> it was like the international it was like all stars for like wildcard regions yes, right yes. like that's 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 sort of what it was you forgot to tell the best story though which was when i was interviewing you on stage <laughs> and it was like the first time like we'd we'd been having conversations the whole time right but like it's not primary school anymore. You don't like just know how old people are. Like that just <laughs> isn't a thing. It doesn't come up, right? We're adults. We don't need to ask those questions, right? Because we're all adults. Anyway, um, the question of age happened to come up um, and it was in a conversation that we were having in an interview on stage. I believe it was after you won a 1v1. Yes, yes. I don't even know why you guys <laughs> were 1v1ing to be perfectly honest, but you, it was after a 1v1 that you guys had you won, you cheesed it with like a tank Caitlyn build. It was yes, absolutely yes. repugnant. <laughs> um, and then I asked you on stage, like how old you were. And I was just blown away. There's actually, there's a clip of this, of me losing my mind. And I was actually losing my mind in that moment. Like my, my brain stopped functioning correctly <laughs> because you were so much younger and it did not make sense with a voice, with the timber of yours, how? <laughs> How did it develop so early? Like, oh my God. Anyway, it was an absolutely fantastic memory. I All of the memories um, that weren't live on the broadcast, we probably shouldn't share, but uh, <laughs> otherwise, an absolutely amazing time. No, this, it, was, it was truly a blessing. I think the age thing didn't help the fact that, you know, we were practically on a rooftop bar <laughs> every single <laughs> uh, evening, yeah. prep day, every single evening, we were on a rooftop bar spending every single dime that we earned during that event because it was expensive as mm -hmm. shit but it, it was, certainly was it was it was it was fucking worth it i remember i remember i remember the first day spawn told me it's like don't interact with people that interact with you basically it's like people mm -hmm. started talking with me 
like on the street and you guys just ignore him and like but he's being polite <laughs> he's just talking to me <laughs> like people just talk and say like, oh mcdonald's maccas there's maccas over here we and they just start talking i'm going over to the right side i'm going to the right side you come in, you're going to the right side you go to the left side and people just having conversations and i, I thought it was just these are people just they're just being nice you know so i'm just gonna interact and Spawn pulled me like mm-hmm. pulled me away as if I was talking to like a dementor or some shit. So you're about to get sucked <laughs> in to, to something fucked up, you know? <laughs> I've actually I've had worse times with that in LA than I have with uh with Melbourne, but really? there is definitely the odd psycho um that you'll run into that you should probably just just keep your head down and keep walking to your destination, unless that's what you're in here for, you know? Like sometimes it's good to go on an adventure with a stranger. Um, but you know, you got to be ready for that. And, uh, there's, there's certainly some roads that you don't want that to go down. Yeah. Honestly, to be fair, I think in America, oh, I also had my strangest experience. Like when I was in San Francisco, like San Francisco Mm -hmm. was strange. I remember that this, this, there was this man who was collecting bottles, you know, he just looked like a regular man, you know, and then, and then he had bottles on all of his fingers, you know, on all of his fingers, he had bottles, you know, (laughs) and then. I was just uh, looking at him regularly. I just, I knew we had eye contact, right? And then, like, oh, he was no. going left and I was going right. And then he just, I would kept walking. And then I started hearing, like, glass, like, 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 it is go- getting, going together, like this sound, you know? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? This sound. And I, I'm, I'm just thinking, I can't turn back, you know? I can't turn back. And I just keep walking. I just pick up a pace. It's in the middle of the day, you know? And then I turn around, and this guy is just doing, like, this wizard hand, you know, with his finger bottles, you know, towards me. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck is happening? And I just enter the closest store uh, that, I, that I find. And uh, yeah. that was my weirdest experience. And I, I, I guess you, you hit it, uh, I think, America. I had, a, I had a similar one in San Fran, actually. Uh, was that for 2017 Worlds when we were the all in? Uh, 2016 Worlds that, was, was, was the one. 2016, 2016. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I remember we, like, between the hotel we were staying at and the venue was a pretty shady neighborhood. There was, yes. like, this stretch of, like, this one block of, like, ultimate shadiness. And yes, that yes. blew my mind, right? Because I'm I'm used to, you know, the layout of my cities being nice, gradually getting worse. Yes. And then it's the suburbs, you know? Like that there's sort of like a, the there's a if you were playing a city simulator, there would be like a, a slowly degrading graph of goodness, you know, coming out from the middle. But no, this was like checkerboard. It was insane. <laughs> and so like we <laughs> you'd you'd be like walking casually and like oh this is nice this is not oh i'm in danger potentially <laughs> it was it was the weirdest experience i remember walking home with frosker and i was like i was like do i need to protect her now and and then after and like immediately <laughs> getting into like oh man it's ridiculous to think that that i need i need, need to be pre- like cuz you know I, I had that chivalry idea go through my yes, mind yes. oh my god it was it was very very strange very very strange so they are uh, thankfully thankfully there weren't as many very talkative people on the street like uh, my experiences in LA where if you stop at a light you will be conversed with by someone <laughs> who has an opinion about something and it's normally very very strange I got yeah I got much better at ignoring people than I ever have in the past because I'm kind of into having conversations just in general but it was there where I was like head down Max head down please you don't want to you don't want to learn anything more about you know, whatever the heck they were talking about. Oh my god! It was <laughs> Honestly, ridiculous. all my San Francisco stories are coming back to me. It's like I remember. Mm-hmm. I remember like there was a stretch of thirty minutes that was like the most bizarre thirty minutes of my life. Well, I went to a Burger King, right? And in the mm-hmm. Burger, Burger King, the workers were like trying to push this dude off the the Fanta, like the the ba- ba- basically like the beverage machine, and he was just like putting his mouth over the Fanta thing. And he was just trying, like, what? it was this huge dude, you know, huge dude. He was, like, borderline Hulk. <laughs> and he was just, like, drinking from this Fanta dispenser, you know. And they were just trying to push him up with a broom. They are like, using every <laughs> every tool that they had. And I was like, shit, I'm not eating a Burger King. And I walked oh past. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm, I'm about to cross. I'm going to Starbucks. And then there's, like, this, this couple, right? And it's, like, this dude walks up to him. He's, like, you want to buy crack? You want to buy crack? <laughs> And then it's like the, the the woman behind her is like, no, don't sell it. We need it. We need it. We need it. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. It was in the middle of the day, you know. I, I like oh my God. it was in the middle of the day. And then I cross and I'm lo- looking over at the Starbucks, right? 
and I'm about to, I, I just want to get my coffee. And I just see someone steal a bike from an old lady. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm peacing out. I'm peacing out. And then, and then finally, finally, man, I am about to cross the street and there's a red light. And then there's this, this lady just crosses the red light, you know, and just walks into traffic. And everyone's honking her horn. Now look, this lady, she had shatter pants. Like this, this lady was lost, man. I was worried for her, man. I, I didn't know where the fuck I was. It felt like I was in a different dimension. And I just went to the venue and there would be RNG and it felt good. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. That's San that Francisco's like, mental, that's some, man. That's some dream shit, though. No. You know how, like... In the dream, it feels like it's normal and you wake up and you're like, I don't think the asparagus should be flying around my room, yes. right? <laughs> like the asparagus was literally flying around and then like someone shat their pants and then wrote it or something like fucking hell, man. That's one of those things that this is I'm, the most ridiculous bro, thing. I feel good sharing it with you. It's like one of those things. It's like it, I tried sharing it with the others. Like, yeah, Yamaro, like relax, man. What, 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 this is not true, right? It's like. It's it's it, so I'm not sure. Like it's one of those stories that is so stupid that I refrain from sharing it. You know? It's, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Oh my god, it's so good though. It's or maybe you accidentally did buy the crack and then the rest was just you. <laughs> like I don't know. If we go back to the beginning of the story, there is definitely a part where I'm like, oh, you know, uh, I don't. I I I don't have any experience. Honestly, so maybe it, that's not what happens when you do it. But I don't know. Maybe that's the method to beating RNG. Just do crack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to tell Dom one about that because uh, they weren't very good at beating RNG. Um, <laughs> uh, that was that was definitely a sad experience. Thankfully, we've got T1 uh, now, Yamato, and you've already you noped out. Um, you told the boys you're like zero three today. Uh, T1 looks too strong. <laughs> I just I don't think it's worth. Like, I love going to Korea, but I know you guys probably just want to stay in Europe and play solo queues. So yes, yes, we'll exactly. just we'll just we'll just throw this one because there is no way any team is ever beating T1, right? That was that was the plan. Yes, that was exactly the plan. Do, do you feel like uh, original pride? Do, do you feel because you left LPL right before they won? Or when, when was your transition? They won and then you moved to LCK 2019? Um, so I moved 2017. Oh, um, so I moved. Uh, I so I arrived at the LCK to watch their demise. Yes. Because we got, I, I was, I was, I was in the LCK. Uh, it took a while for my visa to work out mm -hmm. and getting flights and all that sort of stuff, as it always does. Um, I think you have some experience in this yes, area. Yes. Um, but I arrived in like March or something like that of 2017, mm -hmm. and then we had a nice year. Um, unfortunately, SKT didn't win the final, and that would have been, you know, the fans' dream. Mm -hmm. But we did have, you know, ambition finally ascending the throne. We got the Rise video, which is still my favorite Worlds video of all yes, time. Yes. Oh my god, absolutely amazing stuff. Um, that was really cool. But then, like, 2018 happened, and it felt so similar to 2015 Worlds, Yamato. It mm. felt so similar because 2015 Worlds, I was in the LPL, as you mentioned. Yes, yes, and. Uh, and MSI, oh my god, first MSI ever, my first international tournament ever, and EDG wins in five games, and it was Clear Love's Oof. Evelyn that did it, and Pawn played mid Morgana to give Faker his very first loss on LeBlanc, and like literally, it's like a narrative orgasm, yes, like that yes. whole event <laughs> and our team won, right? And then 2015 Worlds comes around, we're like, LGD is the best team in the universe. <laughs> and everything fucking exploded. And it was just the worst. I remember, it was actually Fnatic versus EDG. I went and uh, did an interview with a fantastic friend, Susie Kim. Mm. And I did an interview with her. And in the interview, I'm like, yeah, well, our teams are just amazing. There's no way that, you know, even if LGD look like a loose cannon, EDG have got this. I walk back and they've they've just lost to Fnatic. I'm like, <laughs> you didn't like the the uh, Jace, the Def what? Jace TP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were some times. I, don't don't talk to me about Jace. There was a certain uh, yeah TP Jace experience. Good old Def Arena. Oh my god, it was uh, it was just not a fun time. It was not a fun time. Thankfully, uh, I came back to I, I came over to the LCK because I was like, well, obviously they're the best right now. And then we proceeded to lose for a couple of years in a row. And uh, that was very, very sad. <laughs> and then now, do you think this is the year T1's going to have it all? Um, oof. Grand Slam? Because well, no one Grand Slammed it yet. Like, T1 was close. No. 
Yep, it, it is. Crazy, uh, crazy it is close. I think if there is ever a year where it's going to happen, it's this year. I think so. But Joe Marsh actually had a pretty good point um, about sort of the changes that have been made in the LCK and things like that, and the fact that T1 already had, you know, a five games in the semifinals caliber roster at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. They bring in Zayas, you know, they age him like a fine wine. You know, over over this split, he's become so much better, I think, and so much more versatile than what Kana was. I think Kana was good in certain situations, but I think his champion pool lacked and his playstyle certainly lacked. He required a lot more attention. Zayas far more rounded as a, as a player. Yes, yes. And man, the team is just communicating so well. But the rest of the teams in the LCK are sort of brand new. Um, so I think that it will get harder for T1 as the year, year goes on. But I think that's only good for them right mm. because they've got so many young players and so much talent that needs to be challenged otherwise they're just going to get bored like you've heard interviews with gumiushi man like that guy's like please <laughs> just give me someone that's good at this game i'm better than everyone it sucks you know like he might keep doing that but uh we need uh, other people to to step up so that there's more of a challenge now practicing against uh t1 last year at the world championship like when we we're screaming against them it was so obvious that that is something like really really like beyond special it was like every game that we played was uh, like there was a fist fight in bot either it ended 5-0 mm. or 0-5 but we would lose <laughs> anyway because it's like rarely when when we scream against teams rarely like at at, at my point uh, and maybe at your point too do i get like amazed by by anyone it's like i felt like that 2018 when we screamed against ig and the shy was like pl playing fiora against us and scrims and rookie as well oriana mm -hmm. and i was like mind blown i was like we are miles away you know we 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 just humble in defeat you know we just accept it you know uh, and yep. um the same thing i felt screaming against t1 like deeper into the games as the games went on and on i think maybe we like one one or two games out of like potentially i believe 18 and it was so obvious that there's something insanely insanely special there it was uh, uh natural that the progression has been like this for them uh with uh, with yeah. a simple change it's like now it's uh they were they were sharing time with, with teddy and i felt like eventually during worlds they felt they kind of came to the realization that uh that gumiushi is just uh, uh superior in every way sorry teddy teddy you're great you're fantastic big fan you know since the good old yeah. days but uh me that, too man that commitment to, I, to five players to, is something else. Yeah, I used to be that guy that was, no, but like Teddy, is st he's got all of that experience, you know, and I'm remembering back to the 92 minute game, you know, the marathon and all that mm. sort of shit. And I was, <laughs> I, I would be like, yeah, but like Gumiushi hasn't shown his chops like this. But then when they chose to run him at, uh, at Worlds and watching him play under all that, uh, under all that pressure, it made me realize that like this is this is fucking innovation's brother like <laughs> obviously like he's made from something different right like his brother is the, like the most famous zerg player of all time and in like in korea was the most dominant in an esport that is the only one that could potentially rival league of legends for its like saturation of this country mm. right and actually, obviously, the saturation of this country for StarCraft was much higher than League of Legends, but it yes, did yes. go for much longer. But still, like, the fact that, like, there must be, I don't know who his parents are, but my God, they bred <laughs> some gamer. They definitely did. Like, something must be in that water or something like that. But, like, that, that family is just ludicrous. But, like, Gumi Yushi, like, even when they were starting in the group, the, the group stage... He was just that class act, right? And he like had all of the talk. He had all of the smack talk and then just backs it up and backs it up and backs it up. And yes, you know, they lose in the semifinal, but for a player to like share time during that year and then finally be, you know, on the main roster and then make it to the semifinals, like, I don't know, blew my mind. I, I, I think that there is, there is no disputing that that bottom lane is, is the best in the world. And we for haven't sure. even spoken about Carrier yet, who I think yes. might be the best player in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. And then there's Faker. I, I've, I've, I've come yeah. to, the in my mind as well, it's like, as as times go by, you see who comes and goes. And it's like in eSports, it's so hard to stick around. It's like even harder to actually keep winning. 
and to be mm-hmm. breaking records so deep into your career it's like like s- some players are still going right like for example impact winning with eg is is fucking impressive that he's he's still uh, yeah. competing at the highest level he competes very silently and then ends up in top positions over and over again i've um I have a very, very high regard and a high respect for those guys that managed to to find good performances year after year because it's so grueling. The game keeps changing, the players keep changing, mm. and um, somehow Faker beating records in, in this current year. I remember people were talking about his retirement last year. It's like, you know, Faker's retiring. Mm-hmm. It's like, Ugh. now, you know, the Faker's just starting. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. They're like the amount of uh, comments you have to wade through, especially like during 2018 and 2019, where people were like, oh, fake is washed, you know, he's probably going to retire soon, blah, blah, blah. He's just he's just not that good anymore. Obviously, his hands don't work as well. The guy's still in his early 20s. Like your <laughs> body doesn't start officially degrading until like doesn't like stop growing until 25. Right. Like. And even then, you, you, if you maintain it, things are going to be fine, right? And I think that, like, the synapses in his brain are going to be all right. Yes, like, yes. It, it's, so, it's so insane thinking about an athlete and then not having that, like, you look at the careers in other sports, right? Like, you look at golfers being real old. You, like, I guess you don't need reaction times. You're playing golf. But, <laughs> but still, like, there are so many other sports where, like, the, the last age that you play is around 33 and things like this. And yes, for for video games, you need a little bit more like micro reaction time and things mm. like this, but but still, I think that like that can be forged in practice. I think the thing that really does stop esports from having like a really long uh, career size, right, is the intensity that these players have to play when they are eventually at the top level. I think that there is a there was a perfect example of. Showmaker and the way that he was talking about a lot of what his 2020 and 2021 were like mm. uh, on Darmon because they had to go to every single tournament and they had to continue being the best and the best and the best. And this is what Faker has done already, right? But Faker is a superhuman and it doesn't make sense. Showmaker was, you know, a, a young kid who was extraordinarily talented and then was faced with all of this pressure all at once, did absolutely fantastically. And then after achieving the ultimate goal, struggled to find like the motivation to do the same thing again, which if you blame anyone for that, like, fuck you straight up. Like, cause that is really, really hard with the amount of practice and the amount of training and the level that they were expected to play to, uh, during that entire time. And I, I think that like, it's a perfect example of why Faker doesn't make sense and why he will never be uh, unseated as just the the goat of League of Legends and maybe just esports in general. Like, it's crazy. No, I'm with you. I think that the key thing in most traditional sports is that everyone starts so much earlier in in what their mm-hmm. career is supposed to be. If we take like Formula One drivers, they start like there's like I got my first. Uh, rally car when I was three years old and it's like they, they just started at some point with like soccer players it's like I was I was doing uh, I was just playing with uh, with the adult team at the age of five and I was just running with the mm-hmm. ball it's like it's always like the, a gradual uh, progression in terms of all of the additional skills that are important in what is like uh, just being a human being is it's like how you manage stress how you uh, deal with um situations how you manage yourself how well you know yourself most of the time i get to deal with players that uh, like the first real piece of responsibility that they have is being in one of the best teams in europe like that's the first time they have Mm -hmm. any real responsibility and how you get thrown into the cold water and how you react to that uh, it's it's a very difficult situation to to adjust to because they've They've been rewarded by like skipping school, skipping responsibility, going home to play league, high rank, good mechanics, and then you get you know thrown into the situation with responsibilities. I think this is always, hopefully, with time, people get to like players uh, have like the more junior leagues where they can grow up in and they understand what it means to be in a team, to have responsibility, and to, to you know coach their way up to uh, mm-hmm. you know finding that. Uh, level of professionalism when you're actually like a top 50 player in in your region uh, and then there's just those those players that have managed to to nail it 
I feel like we are so blessed when it comes to Faker because he's the face of, of esports and there is nothing bad to, to say about him. He's like the perfect example. Uh, like it's impossible to not be a fan of him. Uh, like, yeah. It's like every time I'm at the World Championship and I see him passing the hallway, it's like, oof, he's here, you know? There's a, like a presence. But he'll also, never like, gets old. he'll also wave to you if if you walk past him, right? Like, he's just, he's a class act. It's absolutely yes, yes. right. But he, ne he, like, he's also worked really hard on that as well. Mm. Because if you remember, like, he was, like, true gamer uh, at the very beginning, right? <laughs> was very awkward in interviews. And even if you don't speak Korean, like, he was... He was robotic. He didn't have a lot of the the ability to have like a good TV uh, conversation. But even that has developed so incredibly well. He has that swagger to him now, yes, you know, yes. like that in, that intense uh, faker confidence. Like that a BMW everyone's, pictures like, are crazy. <laughs> yeah, man. Like it, it's 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 just nuts. Like the fact that like it was not it was it a year and a half or something like that where he like did the like the the tumble roll onto the stage it was like that man, was gang like, shit man yeah he he definitely he he definitely upgraded extraordinarily quickly i'm uh i, I want to go back to one tiny thing that you said mm. actually about how you have to bring up players on a team like Fnatic, and mm. i think that it's actually really beautiful because you'll have so much more insight onto what all of these new players on t1 have had to deal with right mm. because Fnatic probably the most famous org in all of Europe, right? Like you won season one, doesn't doesn't go back much like further than that. Like, let's be real. So there is a lot on their shoulders riding straight out of just getting onto the team, right? You have to teach them how to deal with fan pressure. You ha have to teach them how to deal with all of these people getting extraordinarily upset if they don't tie their shoelaces the correct way, you know? Because fans, like humans in general, as a collective are sort of awful individuals can be absolutely fantastic mm. and most of the time they are as a group we're not great and when like fandoms get to like ridiculous sizes the uh vocal minority uh tends to be on the more eccentric side and that can be extraordinarily difficult to deal with and i imagine the same uh was for your players but i couldn't imagine what it's like for these younger players to come up in T1 and come from the academy roster where they're largely being looked at as, oh, who's going to go to what team after they've developed and have to go into this main roster that has the highest pressure out of any team in the world. I just think that it's absolutely amazing that these players have been able to, to find the success that they have and overcome all of the things that they had to in order to get there as well. Like, I just think it's amazing. No, for sure. I'm I'm so curious as to how T1 actually looks like from the inside, because like my only experience in in Korean esports was in Sandbox, and that was like sublime. It was it was so clear what everyone's position was. It everything was so streamlined. Whenever there was any issue, like I I could 100 uh, percent me and the players we could 100 percent focus on 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 the game and playing everything else was taken care of everything else was perfect and the expectations were super super clear and the standard was was so high that everyone in the room had to work out it's like it, it would be too strange not to because of just the the aura and the presence in the room and um mm -hmm. That to me was 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 just immaculate. And then if I think of T1, considering their historical pedigree, and uh, I'm I'm genuinely curious how they onboard new players because time and time again, like every player that uh, you know that is up and coming has been good. At some point, they were in T1, <laughs> they were in T1 <laughs> Academy, and 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 they were doing something, and they just went through that system. And it seems like um, every single player. That is coming up in the in, in the challenge ladder. That's the place you want to be. It's like the biggest uh, attraction, and they keep uh, delivering. Like on our end, usually for me, when it comes to how we manage, like this year specifically, very experienced players across the board. Right? It's like everyone has experience. Like I have uh, players from each of the most successful rosters of Europe. It's like Hilly from from 2018 mm. run i have wonder from from g2 of course and marek from from uh from last year's mad lions and 
you know, the tricky thing always with Spring is that um, you're, you're dealing with so little information because it's like there's only that much testing and, and research you can do on the players mm -hmm. uh, ahead of time. And then you go into Spring and whether you want to or not, you set expectations. And then just because you're working with only five players, uh, you, you are committed to them in a way that is very different from traditional sports because the, the main goal and the main thing that needs to happen is that everyone needs to be okay. Uh, like everyone needs to be happy because if someone goes through some, some rough patch in life or something, it is going to affect everyone mm -hmm. because everything is so fragile in a way, right? It's like, yeah, you know, and if, if one player, let's say he's, he, he breaks his hand, that could be like the end of a season because esports teams, at least in the LEC, from, from what I worked with most of the time, is like you have five players, you're committed to them, and you need to make sure that the group and each individual in that group is whole all the way. So you have to balance out like freedom and how much um, uh, restrictions you can put into place because it's always going to be a ne negotiation because the players need to be fine. And it's very different from in traditional sports if, if, if I have a long bench of substitutes, if a player is not you know, in line with the system that you want to build with the group, you just sub them out and you, and you educate them on it and then you implement them. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you focus on, you know, different players within the group. But in in a team like, like Fnatic, we have five players. You need to commit to these five players and you need to make a lot of compromises. And, and Spring Split turns into just uh, a big research point because I, I look back in, in my career and always Spring, I do a lot worse in Spring than I do in Summer. Because always like that reflection period going into summer, you have so much more information to work with because you, because you know which buttons you need to press to make people, you know, mm -hmm. go that extra extra mile and, you know, just um, finding, you know, the essence of what will keep the group together and keep everyone happy. Luckily, this year, I didn't feel like anyone was really affected by, you know, the, the pressure. You know, it's funny, I always, I, I look back at the first contract negotiation I had with Fnatic and they're like, yeah, uh, you're going to get a lot of fans. You're going to be, you know, in, 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 you know. You already had all of the you fans. Know, what are like, you talking you, about? You know, the usual contract negotiations. You're going to have fans. You're going to yeah. be, you know, you're going to be a part of the Fnatic brand. And now I realize, you know, after, in hindsight, they, they should pay you more for that, you know, because <laughs> dealing with some of the <laughs> yeah. Fnatic fans, they're very passionate and rabid. And I appreciate it, you know. It's like I can see it from their mm. perspective. This is just... It's like you get emotional about something just means you care, you know? It's like, I, I know myself, it's like sometimes I yell at the TV when I watch some sports and I catch myself, it's like I, I wouldn't go online and tweet it, you know, and tweet it at like some football player. It's like, why the fuck did you miss or something? I can't imagine doing that, but I yell at the TV, you know? I, 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 I get that part of it, you know? My job is yelling at the TV. That's what I do. <laughs> I, I literally yelled at every LCK match that we had this entire season. Like, uh, I did that. That happened. <laughs> and I, I agree with you, man. Like, and I, I think that like that passion is awesome. And I don't want anyone to get what I said about, you know, huge fandoms the wrong way. Right. Oh, because they're always the more people that there are, mm. the bell curve has, you know, more outliers. Yes, and yes. when there's more outliers, then, you know, those are the crazies, uh, you know, tend to, to tend to get a little bit louder. But but still, like what it does is it creates so much hype and so much excitement. And I don't, I don't know if you watched uh, the LCK final um, for this spring, but it was extremely special, right? Mm. The 10-year anniversary, we were back at yes, Kintex, yes. and we hadn't had, you know, the classic, you know, LCK final experience, right? Like, there's been some really famous uh, producers that have worked on these things in the past, and, and one of them was Petey Park, who I worked with a lot uh, over at OGN. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of the LCK stuff, also did a lot of uh, Apex. Uh, when Overwatch was good, um, okay. he did a lot of uh, <laughs> the Apex shows, which were just amazing. Mm. Um, also did PUBG and things like that, actually made that game work as a, as a really cool spectacle to watch. Um, but Kintex really reminded me of, uh, of what, what work he used to do. And I think if T1 wasn't there, it would have been less awesome because For sure. the amount of passion that you get from a stadium full of fans that all care so much, like it's impossible to get a ticket for that final, right? Because the entire place sells out in under a second. Mm. Like it's, it's just obscene. 
uh, how competitive it is trying to get into those seats. And there were so many people in there. Like, it still blows my mind, even now. And it's just absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad that, you know, the LCK was able to put on the show that they did because, you know, if you were lucky enough to get in on that, like, 0.4 seconds of, of getting a ticket, you <laughs> absolutely, uh, you know, got your money and luck's worth um, out of attending that show. It was just amazing. No, it definitely felt like... Um like a like an old school authentic uh final it really yeah it's like i've been watching some of the old uh like ogn like uh like the because i was just looking at old faker games and old t1 games and there's 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 something so there's a, there's an element to it there's like this essence that is that tr truly it felt like it was recaptured uh, and i agree with you like without t1 it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same as uh, truly, yeah. truly something. What, what yeah, you... and there are, you know, the, the cool thing is there are a lot of other teams that do have a lot of that star power, mm -hmm. but I don't think no one's no one's up there just yet. Um, but anyway, you had a question. No, I wanted to ask you. You were we were we were together, right, at the 2018 World Finals. Um. So w I was. Were you in the crowd? I was there in the crowd. I was in the crowd because uh, I remember we were party, at yeah. the after party. That I remember. That, that, yeah, that yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. glass floor, the spooky one. It's yeah, like, literally, uh, and and it also like the glass floor. I actually, um, because I was on the train, I went past uh, that exact building. I was remembering that exact after party, mm. and the indented floor had a step around it. Oh, really? And the floor was like looking all the way down, like forty stories or something like that. Why would you have a step? Because I tripped on it multiple <laughs> times and thought I was straight up just gonna die. Like, actually, I oh, remember man. now. I remember now. I remember oh. like it, the, the entertainment. If you didn't want to dance, you you watched that dance floor and you saw people trip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was good oh, shit. Man. Oh, those it a lot was of definitely there. a lot of fun. That was good times. I remember. I, I remember there was a there was a little bit too much frivolity uh, that went on, and I remember watching Sanke. Wait, wait helping, sorry. What does frivolity uh, mean? Now, now you're throwing uh, ex curveballs ex Excitement at me. and fun. Um, okay. Let's just say excitement and fun. Okay. <laughs> um, drinking. Drinking is what I meant. Yeah, I see. A lot of, um, a lot and of I remember blue watching... Potions, mana potions, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Let's continue. Potions, sorry. <laughs> there you go. But uh, Sanke, who is, uh, you know, one of our uh, LCK commentators on the Korean mm -hmm. side, um, he was famously the commentator for Spo TV, while uh, Caster Jun was the commentator for OGN, and they split it that way. Now that we've moved to... The LCK being within Riot, they just they they share days. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching in 2018 Sunke helping Caster Jun like out of the out of the hotel into a cab. And I just thought it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Because, you know, Caster Jun, he just had an absolutely huge final, right? Mm -hmm. You know, got to got to hand one of, you know, his old friends rookie a, a trophy, and that was really cool. And the uh, celebration afterwards and watching the camaraderie. I don't know. It was just beautiful. No, uh, that sure. was one of my favorite memories of that party. <laughs> uh, there were so many people. Holy moly. I think that was my first interaction yeah. with, uh, with with Sam Matthews. I remember all oh, the Fnatic players were not so happy. I remember after the finals. <laughs> and I was just yeah. there, you know. <laughs> just yeah, just uh, yeah. gravitating towards the people I know. And I was like, oh, shit. This place is on fire. I'm gonna walk over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I remember. I remember when the Fnatic players walked in, and I was like, I just, I don't want to be that guy today. I'm just, yeah. I'm not gonna be that guy today. Yeah, I could yeah. talk to them back in 2015. That was easy because I got to be sad about my team getting crushed, and they were happy about crushing my team. Um, <laughs> that was fine. So got to have a chat then. Um, but 2018, I definitely did not go out of my way. Um, it's always really hard when there's a. Uh, when there's players that have lost and how do you deal with it as a coach like after they after they step off after that third game right like what what do you say do you do you give them space or do you have to try and find a way to rally them so they can go to scrims the next day or are they are they going to take a month off anyway so you don't need to worry about it like what's the what's the the the, the game plan there if you don't mind me asking i think it always depends on what comes next right for example when we, after we got three zeroed you know it's like in, in in the past i believe that there is no room for emotions in business but mm. i've realized with time that emotions can be dangerous but at the same time very powerful right and i know that after a loss like that everyone's going to deal with it their own way and i know that uh 
pressing, you know, pressing people to not go through the 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 emotions that they they are actively having is just it's it's not the time and the place, you know. If if we like the main thing that I say is that it's important that you know if someone's angry, someone's pissed, something something, you know, is that that they they internalize it, you know. I've been in many mm-hmm. teams where in moments like that people uh you know, everyone's everyone's very vulnerable everyone's bleeding you know all the wounds are in the open and the worst thing you can do is just like start squirting lemon juice and fucking salt all over the mm. place you know it's just important to not create uh, scars deep enough that um you know with time everything that you're feeling in this moment will make more sense and it will be like a point of motivation so i always say the same thing it's it's just you know what you're going through right now that's okay you do your thing with time, you know, these, these scars, they will heal and they will be reminders of something, you know? Because in my mind, that's yeah. the only way to move forward, you know? It's like if you fuck up, you get trioed, you get reverse swept, you know? The only way forward is to not linger on it too hard and uh, uh, learn from it, you know? I think there's, there's no other way. But in moments, for example, when we got trioed, it was just a question of, you know, it's like, I think it's important to spend time together and to just mm-hmm. just feel the pain together, you know? I think that's important. But uh, other than that, I just let the, let the boys be, you know, and uh, give them some last encouraging words. Make sure that they say bye to each other before people um, go home and uh, move into, you know, uh, uh, into their home country or uh, they don't see, it, see yeah. each other for a long time, pretty much. Yeah, I think that's that sounds like the, the best way of doing it. One thing that stood out with what you said um, about the emotions being powerful, I think I'd never really thought of it that way, right? Because... Emotions are extremely powerful, and if they're negative, it can really ruin an entire team. But if you can move them in a direction, and it's extraordinarily difficult to do, but if you can move it in a positive way, even after a loss, even after a negative experience, if you can curb that, that's extraordinarily powerful as well, because that level of vulnerability has, it's, it means that everything is very influxed. You know, it means mm. every every word that you say can either be extraordinarily damaging or it's also the perfect time to give that correct bit of encouragement and that correct bit of feedback and 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 like arm your player with the ability to do something better afterwards. I'd never really thought of it like that because I felt like it was it was more of like I don't know, you're you're feeling extraordinarily down and then well let's wait until we're not down and then we'll try and fix. But it's, it's also like a really, really important time to, to start that rebuild. And I think it's, I think it was uh, very insightful. Mm. No, I, I, I was taught this lesson. It's like, I, I come from a family that is very emotionally cold. It's like, you could never show emotion. Like my father's very old school, mm. you know, his brain legit. It's been teleported from 500 years ago and then inserted into him yeah, like he is very yeah. no tears no whining no nothing and this is how i've been you know and i still am to a certain degree you know so all the habits mm-hmm. die hard and um yeah you know uh, we had we were working with this um handball uh player like former handball player called joel abati and um his his nickname was the reverend and uh wow. ba- basically what he would do, so this this was like one of the he's one of the most accomplished handball players. He won like the he won the Olympics, he won uh, the uh-huh. World Championship like for France. He won like the Bundesliga. It's like he he was telling us stories about how he came to 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 Germany during like uh, like he came to a city where he was like the only you know uh, African man that had ever been there. So he like faced a lot of racism and so forth. But then he won over the whole city because he he won uh, the the league for them and what he would accomplish was just amazing. And he taught me he had he had like his English wasn't like perfect, but he was always telling me Yamato. You need to show love. And then he would like push me like really hard. Love. (laughs) You need to show love. And then he kept repeating this. And then it finally clicked, you know. It finally clicked. It's like everything in life that is powerful can be used for for bad and for good. And I was always, you know, Mm. in in lines like there's no room for emotions. Emotions are dangerous and inconsistent. But you can arm them, you know. If If you learn enough about people around you, whether it's, uh, you know, 
uh, your significant other or anyone. You're like emotions. Th this is what living is, you know, the happiness in it, the joy, the love. You need to just be very aware of yourself, you know, because the same time negative with like emotions can be very negative. You know, emotions can dictate a whole lifetime. It's like I've, I've seen so many people that um, have are so negative in their thinking that it affects everything that they do. And there's not like a like an ounce of, of sunlight uh, seeping through. And um, I, this realization came to me, you know, back in, what was it, 2018. I was like, oof, this, this is it, you know? It's like you, you yeah. have moments in life like that when, when you interact with someone and you, it's just so, so enlightening in, in, in a way that you, you couldn't actually imagine before that, you know? And now when I think back yeah, how yeah. I was before that, it's like I can't imagine thinking any other way, you know? It's like it's the, the fully brain shattering moment. But those are always the best. Yes, yes. I wish I had more of them. I've had so so many over over my years. But I mean, what stands out to you the time, most? Like that's that's growth, man. Like it's it's so incredibly powerful. Give me oh, give me the there's, give there's me the top a... top ones. What comes to mind when I ask the question? Like what was what was like revolutionary uh, to to you, Atlas? I mean, there's a lot of them, and they're great and small, right? Like. They go back to sort of how I've been molded as a person, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, my initial, one of my first serious relationships, I was really quite jealous. Mm. And I learned a very valuable lesson, which was that there is literally never anything good to gain from being jealous. Mm. And she didn't actually teach me this, but... I was dealing with it and I spoke to a close friend of mine who just asked me the question, what are the good things that come from jealousy, Max? Mm. What are they? And I couldn't list any. And they said, well, there are none. It's actually just, you know, it's just, a, it's a pure negative emotion. Mm. And that's, that sort of, that, uh, that lesson stuck with me throughout my whole life. And then there's, there's smaller ones, right? There's like, something that Jat told me that stuck with me for a very long time, which was don't say the names of abilities if they don't make sense. So <laughs> use shockwave because when the shockwave happens, people understand and they resonate with it, right? But you don't need to say, I don't know, like, what is it, skip and snip or something like that? That's <laughs> Gwen's bash. You don't need to say that. You don't need to say that ever, actually. You can, if you want to, to mix it up, but just saying dash, probably going to be fine. You know, you don't need to say snip, snip, snip every time she presses Q. You know, you can just say, in she goes with the scissors. You know, you can do things like that. And uh, and that that stuck with you. That was like many years ago uh, mm. that, that Jad said that. And it's, it's always been there in the back of my brain. Um, the other one was artosis when he says, like, uh, I don't know what we were talking about, but there's this beautiful artosis quote where we were talking about like how you should pronounce players names. And he's like, I'm the bloody commentator, right? I'm mm. the one saying it. I'll say it how I want. And that will be how their <laughs> name is pronounced. I don't care about learning it. <laughs> the artosis, uh... I didn't follow that one as much, but that was definitely a very artosis thing. And I needed to say it. I love the the like the more old school generation of, of casters. They are so giga chat, you know. <laughs> Did you meet Tasteless when you were out here? He often uh, he often comes out, but I know that it was really hard to get you he, uh, away uh, from the team. We were talking about doing a podcast episode, and then it just never happened. Like, oh, like, I, I, like I followed StarCraft to all my life, so it's like for me that was like holy shit, you know? It's like this, this. I think I, t I think I told him about it because that was when that was sort of right at the beginning, mm. um, when he just started his podcast, right? And I think I was like, dude, you should have your motto on while he's here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, his uh, his schedule around that was uh, was really difficult at the time because I think it was doing ASL, GSL, and all sorts of stuff all at the same time, so mm. it was difficult. But uh, hanging out with him definitely a whole lot of fun it's been mm. a big uh highlight of uh of my time here in korea absolutely i got i like what you what you said like the first thing it's like what good comes out of acting a certain way it's such a good question to to always ask yourself because a lot of such so many things come out of ego you know it's like i want to get yeah. this out of my system it's like i'm feeling negative emotion x and I allow myself to to act a certain way. 
it's it's a very good question to to always ask yourself in terms of like anal- analyzing our own, our own behaviors in, in in a certain fashion yeah yeah, yeah. It, it really benefited me not only in sort of that avenue but to just question if you're feeling like shit, feel free to question it right mm. just uh just constantly be evaluating how your behavior is and you know we all we all fail at it often um but being able to understand that like self-awareness is so extraordinarily important uh yeah was uh was a pretty good lesson i was very glad that i learned it quite uh quite young no for sure this is actually like um i was having a conversation well i believe with someone in the chat uh the last time i was just streaming and um like something that that the reason, that the main reason uh, I reached out to you was, or like why it crossed my mind was because every interaction that I've had with you has been genuinely very positive. You know, it's like I've never walked away <laughs> interacting with you and, and feeling worse. But I always feel better, you know, and there's something very, very powerful about that, you know. And I was like having these thoughts surrounding just the the power of 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 thinking positively and the opportunity that we have in every interaction that we have to to do something good because it's very easy to feel small in this world right because it's it's so vastly yeah. large but at the same time uh, there, there was this thing that, that I heard a long time ago that was so profound to me it's like if you meet let's say a thousand people in your lifetime uh, if they meet a thousand people as well, then all of a sudden you, you've you've interacted somehow with a million, and then you're casting a very wide net. You you pass a smile to someone, and then maybe that person goes on to save the whole world. Right? Somehow everything is connected. And mm-hmm. when I thought of this, instantly you came to mind. So I'm curious, uh, Alice, in in terms of how your mind works, right? Like my mm-hmm. impression of you is that you are very overwhelmingly positive. Every interaction I've had with you has been very, very good, you know, and I appreciate that a lot. What what goes through through your mind? Like, so how how do you function, so to speak, in the context <laughs> of what I just said? <laughs> Firstly, thank you. That's a that's a really beautiful thing to say. No one said that before, and I really appreciate it. Um, but I don't I don't necessarily know. I think it's. I think most of what you're talking about comes down to listening and not mm. necessarily just listening to words that are being said, but how they're being said. Mm. And if you can hear in some, in the way that someone's speaking that they're feeling a certain way, then you can act on that, right? And I think everyone gets it wrong a lot of the time. Mm. I think sometimes, like I've had a lot of negative uh, you know, conversations and I can be taken the wrong way extraordinarily easily. As an Australian, it's very, very, you know, <laughs> easy for us to uh to get misconstrued because we often use insults as a compliment Mm. um that's it's how i've been brought up my whole life um (laughs) that's how most of my friendships work um but we like to mix that in right because that's that's a way of showing someone that you love them in a very different way because you feel comfortable enough to be insulting and be sort of it's almost like a vulnerability in a, in a, in a kind of way. It's like, I'm willing to potentially ruin this entire interaction mm. by saying something that could potentially be inappropriate. Um, but because I know you so well and we're so close, you'll understand and give me the benefit of the doubt. And demonstrating that level of trust is, I think, what the sort of almost like trash talky, I think it's I think it's Australian culture, but mm. it might be. It's, I think it's in England as well. There's a, there's a lot of uh, cultures that are very in Sweden much too. Similar honestly, to with, it. With, with my gang, it's like the, the closer you are to yeah. someone, the less filters you have. You just say yeah. whatever's on your mind, you know. <laughs> and also, sure. like you're never worried about you're never worried about insulting someone. You're never walking on eggshells because you trust each other so much, right? Mm. And it's kind of hilarious because I think you and I, even back in. 2016 or something a million years ago i think we started on that foot i think that that was part of part of the reason why i was so surprised that you were so much younger than i was because it felt like we were on we were on a very similar level at the very beginning Mm. and that's not normally something that you necessarily share with someone that's uh you know in a different almost in a different generation right although i think we're the same it's just very opposite ends but you know what i mean like Mm. I think sometimes you just, you find someone with a mind that clicks and 
just becomes effortless, right? Which is why you should have come out more when you're in Korea. <laughs> no, for sure. Uh, it's like, it's, it's always easy to find excuses as to why I shouldn't, you know, with, with being busy and all, but uh, no, mm. for sure. I always end up regretting uh, not no, no, going no out pressure, more, you know? of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one time we went was very nice. I remember Ashley Kang was, was doing writing interviews in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were yeah, at the bar yeah. at 2 a.m. I asked if they had yeah. that uh, old school music from like 80 years ago and they had it. That was sick. I don't remember yeah, that yeah. place. Oh, yeah, because we went to that. We went to the little janky place, right? Like the yes, upstairs yes. joint. Oh, man, that was so much fun. And our producer came. That was a, that was a really good night. That was a For really sure. good night. That we ate some rice cakes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that cool, like that uh, Al Capone ish bar underground, you know, with yeah, the expensive yeah, drinks. Yeah. That was a nice yep. place, too. I like that place. Oh, that was a very good night. That was a lot of fun. Definitely. Um, I'm such a big fan of how just you can just walk in any direction in Korea and it'll be nice and refreshing. Does that ever get boring for you to? It's like you've lived there now for a couple of years, right? It's like, does that mm. feeling, does it still feel surreal to you? Because I've been there maybe seven, eight times, and I lived there for three months, and it always felt surreal. Yeah, it hasn't really stopped. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, there's so many cultural differences that, you know, I, I, I spent a large many, uh, a large amount of my years uh, in Australia before coming over to Korea. And mm. one of the, one of the things that really still sticks with me is the level of safety mm. that i've fallen into just in public right mm. the uh the 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 lack of of crime on the street makes makes things feel so much safer no a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's so much uh cctv but yeah like this is. those those san francisco stories don't exist in korea <laughs> outside of like people being too loud sometimes if mm. they've been drinking a lot of soju in a hoishik after work and and stuff like this and there is definitely a massive drinking culture over here but it it ends up being like there are businessmen you know asleep in doorways sometimes you know near bars but it's never like people being completely obscene mm. or no one goes after a stranger you know you can always be a person that is just walking by and you don't have to feel unsafe and mm. You know, I'm a I'm a big guy, so obviously it's it, I'm I'm less likely to be, uh, you know, picked out as a target, right? But in Australia, I felt a certain amount of fear when I was walking, you know, the streets of a of a city at night, right? Um, but in Korea, you just that that experience doesn't really doesn't really happen um, quite as much, and that's that's never ceased to to amaze me. Um, about being in Korea, that and how delicious the food is in comparison to everywhere else. Yes, yes. No, I, 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 for sure. I've had a very similar experience in the, in the same fashion that you, you explain. It's like I've it's there's some cases where I fear for my own safety. In, in essence, it's like I walk a little bit faster. I look behind me and, and I just am, mm. I, I'm like way more alert. Right. But in, in Korea, I remember uh, like I was um, like in Korea, I was, I had like this, I was stressed. So I was just smoking, you know, smoking, very yeah. bad habits, dirty habits, you know, uh, it was smoking. And then often it's like, I walk outside 4 a.m., 5 a.m. And I see like, um, I just see people that seem like in a, in a whole different environment would be like a, a target. They just walk, no problem yeah. at all. And it's just that, that is such a reassuring, you know, thought to have um, cross one's mind, you know, it's like, oh, everything is just. It's 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 normal that everyone can just just be. There's no fear when when it's dark and and like things get crazy. I, I like that part a lot. Yeah. No, for sure. I don't know what what sacrifices there are in that, but I haven't felt them. You know, with the CCTV. Um, it's, it's yeah. It's it's sort of one of the it's one of the big positives of having such a very strong uh, sense of culture, mm. um, society and career is still very, um, culturally driven. And because it's a, it's a country that's come up so quickly, mm. you know, in the eighties, basically everything was still being built. Right. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's a technological superpower, mm. um, very, very quickly. And when that happens overnight, a lot of the old fashioned ideals, I mean, that's everyone's parents, right? Mm. 
And so you have a lot of things that don't have the same amount of importance and relevance that are still getting getting taught as, you know, fundamental, you know, life skills and things like this, like the amount of respect that you need to show your elders and mm. and all these all these sort of things that are so very uh, ingrained in Korean culture. And I think what that does is it creates an extra la extra layer. And, you know, yes, a lot of the safety stuff isn't necessarily about that, but I think it does like the sense of responsibility that you have uh, for your family and things like this and the things that are instilled in people in Korea is it's just real nice in a lot of in a lot of ways, sometimes suffocating mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of people do suffer for it, but I think it comes from the right place. And yeah, it's 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 a very interesting place to be with the fact that there is so much growth and watching what has happened to the culture over that is uh is pretty crazy um by the way thanks medic for the raid oh thanks medic good to see you good to see you too man <laughs> i um you know i've i've always had the impression that um i've 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 i felt the same way in 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 when i was in japan as well in in essence that um honor and pride and the importance of the group is 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 such a bigger priority uh, while in the west the ideals come from the the stars hollywood and so forth and everyone in some shape or form is is fending for themselves and they want to um kind of um you know become the star in their own movie uh, so to speak and it's a lot less focus uh, on on the group uh, which uh, I'm a bigger fan of, of of the latter, honestly. I think it's a, it's a it's a more fulfilling way of of, of life. But I am looking at it at yeah. a very surface level, and uh, I'm just giving that caveat because I, maybe I'm missing something, right? Just from from my impressions. Yeah, I think there's like there's sort of beauty in both, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's sort of it's good to come from somewhere and be patriotic, but it's also good to be the only you. Mm. Uh, on the planet right and finding a balance between the two of them is i think what everyone struggles with until they die right it's for sure <laughs> trying to carve out your niche whilst also fitting in i think it's like a very fundamentally human problem and like how much do you fit in and how much do you do you carve out and it's 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 really rough i've uh i've definitely personally taken the more i just want to be the only atlas which is why I'm very sad that I lost all my hair because that certainly <laughs> helped with my individualism. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting thing. And I haven't thought about it that much after being uh, here in Korea for so long recently, right? I, mm. I got that question so many times in the first few years where I was like, oh, what's different about Korea to Australia? And I'm like, oh, the food's spicy, you know, and like all this sort of stuff. <laughs> but after living here for five years, you get more of a sense of, you know, how the people think and the changes and all that sort of stuff. And my fiance is Korean, right? And there are a lot of things that I, a lot of assumptions that I had about how people think about stuff that were just completely wrong. Mm. And it's one of, one of the reasons why I love her so much is because she's always challenging the way that I look at the world, right? And I challenge her back and mm. we, we sort of meet in the middle of this like unique relationship of, I'm an Australian guy that has unique thoughts, but I was brought up Australian. And so I think this certain way, and she is a unique Korean that has, you know, Korean upbringing mm. and then all of those sort of thoughts. And like, it's what you've been taught who you are, mm. plus someone who's on the very opposite side of that. Right. And, uh, I think it's just been, it's, I don't know. I love it. I think it's fantastic. That's amazing. I like how your eyes, they perk up when you, when you talk about your fiance, it's, it's very nice. <laughs> It's, it's, it's Did you get nice. to meet her when you were out here? Because I think she was uh, in her hometown for a, a bit of the time and couldn't, I, I, couldn't come out. I don't think so. Because I feel like I like when I remember when I tweeted at you, you know, about like mm -hmm. your Genshin Impact stuff. I was like, yo, is this your waifu? <laughs> you know, and I, I, I for some reason had no idea that you, you were uh, engaged, you know. And I was like, how could I have missed this? You know, I felt like it I, was, I, I was wasn't invited recent. or something, you know. I was like, I, I didn't get invited. <laughs> you know? Part of it is like, well, how could yeah. I miss this? And I was just projecting out. I was like, this is Atlas' fault that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely, it is It is my fault. I try to keep a lot of personal stuff uh, private from mm. things like social media. I think I'm like 
very old fashioned when it comes to that. I'll talk about anything that's video game related in social media until the cows come home. But personal stuff, I don't like just doing the I'm going to take a photo of every one of my meals and and post it for random people to see. Mm. I'll take a photo of my meal and send it to people whose opinions I know I care about to see or people that are about to eat said meal, mm. you know? I just don't think it's like relevant I, using the meals like ex as an example. But yeah, yeah. For most things like I want to share those times with people that I'm close to, not like anyone ever. Because I think that like, you know, kind of nice to have a bit of privacy no i'm with uh, you in your life I, I i do the same thing it's like for me I've, I've realized that i have to accept that anything that i put out there will and can be scrutinized to like the point of no return so anything that i wouldn't want you know you know like analyzed to to shit and be you know judged in the most porous of of manners and and forms if I don't want that, then I just keep it uh, to myself because I know that, you know, it's like, especially if you, like if you post something on Twitter, there's always going to be that group that is always going to try uh, interpret whatever you do in the most negative yeah. manner possible. And that's fine, right? I, that is, it's like, it's, 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 it's so strange how social media is a thing. It's like, we, we are not mentally prepared as a species to, to have social media at all because we are so prone to searching negative things. And I remember reading about this, it's like, we, there, there's something genetically programmed in us that it's important for us to gossip and to have a negative information because it was important to our survival. It's like, oh, yo, there's this mushroom over there that's poisonous. Don't yeah. eat that shit. And that information like just spreads around the whole town. And everyone knows that that mushroom is yeah. poisonous or don't go to that house. There's a filthy uncle there. Don't go there. You know, it's just it was important for survival, you know. And nowadays, yeah. it's like that that genetic function is still within us. And now everything like the how the algorithms function and so forth. This is a big tangent. Everything is also so negatively perceived. So I'm I'm with yeah. you on on the privacy point. It's like if I don't want something to be judged completely to to any point possible, then I keep it uh, to myself. It's what I've uh, come to terms with, you know. But what I what I've realized that one one of the main fundamental flaws of social media is people that take their problems and post them online for random people to talk about mm. and just say it from their perspective as if it's black and white and then take what people then say as this is the right thing to perceive, right? Mm. Because in my opinion, the only way that you can ever get actually good advice is to talk to someone who knows the context of the situation yes, yes. from outside of you, right? Because if you're just projecting your lens of a thing onto countless random people that you don't know, they're going to see it through your lens as well. And then they'll side with you. And then you have your own echo chamber. And then that doesn't help you at all. It just makes you more insane. Like it's, oh my God. It sort of blows my mind that that connection to reality and the necessity for having a conversation with people that are actually there experiencing the thing that you're experiencing, right? And yes, sometimes, you know, it's difficult to find someone that's experienced exactly what you have, right? And like, mm. this is a perfect world sort of situation, but like, you need to talk to someone that's actually close to the issue at hand rather than just throwing it out from your perspective and saying like, hey, but like, what should I do? Like, someone's hitting me on the head with a bat and <laughs> they don't have the context that you're actually playing gladiator. And like, that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Um, you know, like, and being hit with a bat is kind of the game, you know? Yes. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, it's so true. It's, it's, it's like, that's why, you know, always when, when players and, and coaches talk about like what's going on in the team, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's like everyone always, it's like after, oh, Fnatic 3-0, Yamato says nothing. He just waffles <laughs> and talks in generalities. And it's like I don't want to reveal anything sensitive because once again it will be it will be judged to the point of no return and people won't and understand. No one has that context. No one right? has the context yeah, for yeah. sure. It's the same thing. It's like if um, it's the same if if I like I don't necessarily go to anyone. It's like I I've been together with uh, my girlfriend now for for close to six years. I love her more than anything. I'm very happy, you know, and. 
for me, it's, it's the same thing. It's like if I began to talk about, uh, like, like, sure, we argue, we have our things, right? And if I went to talk to someone about, uh, like, if I talk to a friend or something, they also don't have the whole context, right? And the same way I, yeah. I, I view it from the other side, if someone comes to me uh, to advice, I always try to remember I don't have the full context. I have this person's perspective. It's like the the, the fruit bowl. You're, you're in you're in uh, you're in class. Everyone's painting the fruit bowl from their own direction. It's like yo, yeah. you have a fucking banana in your picture. There's no fucking banana. Say like, oh, there's a banana from this side. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. There's a banana over here. It makes sense. Okay, perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 It's it's so incredibly important. But it's you know there are there are times and a place to you know take uh, issues that you might be having and talk to other people, but. If you are talking about a relationship, group therapy, mm. pretty cool thing to do because mm. then you get to do both at the same time. Mm. Hog champ. What a ridiculous tangent that we went on. We yes. really, we really went off off the deep end on that <laughs> one. I think somehow we got from like talking about how amazing Faker's career is to like <laughs> life lessons in a very. I guess it t took us a while, but it felt like it was a very uh, a, a very fast turn. I loved it. I'm curious about something, Atlas. I'm curious yeah, yeah, yeah. about your comedic influences, right? So it's like, I'm sure you've been asked the questions, like what what is your casting influences? But in, in some shape or form, like the way we talk and the way we we, we are, it it always comes from, from certain places. And it, it mm -hmm. came to mind, it's like when... When I tweeted out something about that one, you said, and I said, it's, I have vacation brain, I should just, just peace out. And then you said, um, uh, your brain is m my favorite brain or something like that. And it reminded <laughs> me of this, this skit in the office where there was a, like this, there's this uh, receptionist. She was, um, I don't know, have you watched the office? Um, I've watched a fair bit of the British office. I haven't watched a lot of US office. So basically the US office, Pam, receptionist, she works as a receptionist. She wants to branch out. She likes painting. And then all of a sudden she had the courage mm. to paint. She put on a painting show. And then her fiance was this like brute, like Shrek. No, not Shrek. Shrek is a good dude. Like this brute, mm. you know, that just, just a hooligan, you know. And then he came to check his her art. And then he said, your art is the prettiest of all the art. And then he just <laughs> left, you know. And your phrase for some reason reminded you of that. But nevertheless, yeah, yeah, yeah. back to the initial question: your your comedy influence, like what 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 is, where does your humor come from? Because I think that's usually the essence in 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 my mind of what makes a great caster, an 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 entertaining person, right? And mm -hmm. you're fucking funny to me, you know. So you fucking crack me up. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> so so where does it come from? What's what's the the influence? Well, uh, I guess my dad was pretty funny in a dad mm -hmm. way growing up mm. but he also um was a good person so he showed me things like faulty towers and monty python very early okay blackadder <laughs> as well like i grew up with a lot of old british comedy okay which you know became my favorite because it's very it's it's dark it's often self-deprecating yes, yes. um which i absolutely love because as a comedian self-deprecating so much easier right because you just get to insult yourself <laughs> and no one can get offended from that, right? Because you, you just get to take it. You know how much you can take, so it's fine, yes, right? Yes. Um, from there, I watched a lot of stand-up and things like this. Mm. I've got a lot of, uh, you know, favorite comedians, but that stretches, um, you know, from all over the planet, right? Mm. Um, recently, I mean, I've been watching a lot of Bill Bailey stuff recently. Okay. Um, was, a, was a Black Books fan for a long time, but realized that he did a bunch of, a bunch of stuff like just uh i haven't, himself. Heard, I haven't like heard about an orchestra this thing like, okay he's really he's he's really really funny and an amazing musician at the same time and i really like that okay. that combination um also uh tim minchin who's an australian comedian actually um who's now i think living in london and directing uh shows like broadway shows and stuff okay. like that uh, he directed matilda which was amazing wrote a lot of the music for it as well um, but he was a comedian that did just really funny, intelligent comedy. Okay. And he's a great pianist at the same time. So it's like, whoa, wombo combo. And okay. I've just always, I've always loved that. Spawn and I would listen to musical comedy, like mm -hmm. most trips to work um, that we would do, uh, which was like, you know, an hour each day, right? <laughs> just listen to musical comedy in the car. 
because he was just a big fan. Wasn't really a musical man himself, but okay. loved musical comedy more than anybody else that I knew. <laughs> I see. That's interesting how how as long as their passion as long as there's passion, it's so obvious and things can melt together. Mm. It's it's like you mentioned how this this man is is a pianist and a comedian and he just melted them together because I'm certain he had passion for both. And yeah. I've I've caught myself like watching smithing videos. It's like you click you go on YouTube and then I just yeah, watch this, this, this man just just blacksmithing and I'm like mm -hmm. He's talking. It's super nice. I, I I will never touch metal in the way he did ever in my life. I have no interest. Mm -hmm. But just because of the, the sheer passion he showed through it, it's kind of inspiring somehow, right? Yeah. Dude, I, I watched a, a video of a guy remodeling his kitchen. I really enjoyed it. It was amazing. <laughs> it was great. Um, wood turning. Been watching wood turning as well. You know, okay. enjoy a bit of that sometimes. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Mm. But... Watching talented humans be talented in their particular field, I think is just always going to be a good thing. I think it's just sure. always there's something just enjoyable about watching people be good at stuff. Mm. It's inspiring. And it doesn't matter what it is, because you can be inspired to just try to be that good in any field that you want, right? Yes, yes. Like it doesn't matter what it is. And so like I watch, for ex your example, right? Like I watch a dude forge a sword you know, in 2022, and I'm like, wow, it's so completely obsolete, but <laughs> awesome. I want to be a commentator that, that's that good, you know? Mm. That, like, what, how can I, like, make the edge of my commentating as sharp as this guy's mm. sword? Blah, blah, blah. It's just inspiring, right? It's just awesome. I, I don't know. Makes yeah, me happy. Sure. I feel like we're so blessed to, it's like we have access to the biggest library that has ever existed. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, you know, good things out there. That's why I'm so sad that, you know, the algorithms are always pushing like negative things onto us because there's so much good. There's, there's so much, so much good out there. Yeah. Oh, my God. OK. Speaking of which, mm. right, the algorithm doesn't just push crap. Right. And mm. yes, it, it, there is a lot of it. Mm. But I watched a video just the other day of okay. a dude that went to a supermarket, bought a lobster and then raised it. <laughs> brought it home, put it in a fish tank and raised it. And he has this beautiful, like, I don't know what it is about his voice. I don't even think his microphone's that good, but he's, okay. he's got this real storytelling voice mm. as he talks about his pet lobster that he has. And oh my, I was enthralled. But like I, I watched, there was multiple videos about this lobster's journey, you know, and <laughs> oh, it was just, it was just awesome. I loved it. Okay. And I look, I don't even eat lobster. Like, I, don't know. Just, I think that's probably better. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. It's, it's probably, I mean, I have before. It's not like it's it's one of the things that I enjoy the most. But like, I've never really, I've never been like one of those people that is like, oh, it's a lobster. Isn't that isn't that cool? I haven't been passionate about sea creatures, mm. but I was passionate about this particular sea creature. It was okay. it was just really cool. That was crazy. <laughs> Fucking national. Yeah, it was Leon the lobster. Gonna... It's in chat. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was Leon the lobster. That's, he was great. I was thinking, like he's saying, was his name Homer Simpson? Like I was thinking about the <laughs> Simpsons skit too, about how he raised the lobster and he was so cute, and then he was oh, giving yeah, yeah. he was giving it a bath in really hot water, <laughs> and then it, yeah, <laughs> I remember that. I remember that episode. <laughs> the golden age of, of Simpsons. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, I, 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 I love British humor too. It's like I've Ricky Gervais always blows my mind. Oh yeah. It's like, oh, I, yeah. I, have you watched have you watched his recent show that he's done afterlife yes oh my goodness oh, it's dude, so good i love that show so much it's just the right amount of british -y funny yes. with the right amount of knowing what life's about oh my god it's beautiful it's, absolutely fantastic it's so rewarding to watch like I, I yeah for me genuinely top three Maybe if someone asks me, is it the best show ever for me? For me personally, like I feel so good after I watch those episodes. It's like such a range yeah. of emotion. It really cuts deep on the laughter part and also on, on the actual, you know, engaging parts. And uh, Rick, Ricky Gervais is just, he's just a fucking genius. Yeah, I think I like if you share similar perspectives and, you know, Ricky Gervais has been very, very clear about what he thinks of the world, you know, mm. and the way that he looks at it. Mm. And 
it really resonated with me listening to a lot of his comedy and mm. we're just watching him over the years right and to watch a show that is like so beautiful and poignant from a very similar perspective of what I grew up with my whole life and how mm. I've thought about the about the world in general. I don't know. It's just it's it's a lot of those moments that you get where you're like, "Yes, that is what I was thinking that one time when I had like when <laughs> this, you know, that thing happened to me, right? Like you can really sort of understand and get at the level. It's it's really really cool. That's it's really sure. awesome. And something that I think that in, you know, my role as a commentator is like it's what we sort of strive to do, right? Like I've witnessed Ricky Gervais translate the way he sees the world and then helps you understand it mm. in a way that like we struggle to do almost every single day, right? Like we need to be understood as easily and as quickly as possible in our job. And the way that it's done so effortlessly there, it's it's very different, right? It's not like in the moment, like it would be if he was doing stand up and stuff like that. But mm. there is so much to to take from being able to translate the world. And we have to translate League of Legends, right? But he's translating life experience and what it feels like to go through what he's felt like. And mm. it's just, I don't know. I feel like that's an example of getting it right. And I strive to be able to get it right like that in what we do as well you know no for sure no i i was so fortunate to to see to catch ricky gervais uh, live with the oh my god it would have been amazing basically he's he's currently i don't think he has released a special yet but he just you know he he was just so charismatic because in in essence like the the comedians they are just testing stuff out like they're testing the material right on the crowd and he was just like oh you guys are gonna love this one and then he just proceeds, <laughs> and, and he's like, "You guys are gonna love this joke." And it's just, and then he just proceeds. It's just a Hitler joke, and we're in Germany. You know? yep. so it's just, and it's just, oh and it's like whenever so, something went wrong, he's, "Oh, okay, I guess this one's shit." And I just threw away the piece of paper, you know. Then just continued, and then he just, I don't, he just, whatever happened, he could just hypnotize us right back in, you know. It's like he just had full control over that room, and. He could just lead the experience exactly as, as as you're describing it. It was it was so easy to to imagine and be in tune with what he's saying. Uh, it was it was truly that, uh, like a work yeah, of I, art. I think, and but that's that's him, right? Mm. And so he reads the room. He tries like an array of jokes, right? And this is this is the like the best comedians in the world are the best at doing this as quickly as possible. Mm. They read their audience. And they're like, okay, this joke's gonna work. This joke's gonna work. Mm. This one's going to work. And they build a narrative for their night around sort of that. And yes, yes there yes. are a lot of shows that are that are very stagnant in the way that they're done, but the tone and the delivery and things are done differently each time. Mm. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember who I saw Jim Jeffries here in Korea. Oh shit! And that was a weird experience like okay. really really weird right because <laughs> jim jeffries is an aussie and yeah, yeah, yeah. if i was to see him in the melbourne film festival right mm. i think that the show would have been very very different to how it was with a korean crowd that are mainly able to listen not uh not too confident actually you know heckling or talking back and things like yeah, this yeah. But the way that he delivered it was still absolutely hilarious in a korean context in a lot of it yes, yes and yes it was a show it was rehearsed and things like this but it was also done in a way that was like very in tune with what the room was doing and the, the man's a genius right so mm. it was it was extraordinarily funny um but it was just really cool being like i was i was there with nick with tasteless mm. and uh and one of his mates and it was just it was really really cool mm. really really cool well, that's interesting, actually. Like the, the the concept of, like you mentioned it, it it before too. When I asked you, you know, what what goes in in it goes through the mind of of, of Atlas, and <laughs> it's it's it was kind of it it's, it spoke to me very dearly the the idea of how much information we take in in terms of who we are interacting with, and it just happens on such a subconscious level that. Uh, because I'm, I'm trying to think it's it's like often like interactions occur and 
it's like the goal is always to to have like a great interaction so it's like to walk away with something good you know with with every interaction yeah. that you have you know and and then it just kind of happens it's like there's so many subtle cues it's like crazy how the mind works you know in terms of what we perceive don't perceive and then it's just like just a s simple dip in the tone of body posture or anything it's in, and then do, to do that on such a grand scale must must be crazy and now i'm tying it into to your job i i must imagine as well like working in an actual arena and having the the, the, the crowd behind you in, in in essence does that shape as well how you would deliver things absolutely hmm. oh my god yeah it's it's actually one of the challenges of being here in career is that we don't get any crowd to bounce off right mm. like the closest thing to a crowd that we have is twitch chat mm. and i mean that's you don't get much of a bounce <laughs> off of twitch chat um unfortunately and yes it can be useful in in certain times especially in downtime right like you can use it for an opportunity to to have you know very small conversations and things like this but mm. it's not like the reaction that you get from you know making a joke and then having an arena explode right yes, yes. And i remember in in 2015 uh the the opl final uh the summer final was held at luna park in sydney mm. in the big top and so it's it's sort of like a, a huge tent that uh the players played in and we had like a huge <laughs> crowd in there as well um and spawn and i were commentating and it was just it's next level being able to like especially in an enclosed space like that where it all feels it actually feels kind of intimate even though there are like thousands of people in there because it's like it's shaped in a certain way and the acoustics work in a certain way you really do feel at like as like a, you're a group that are experiencing the game together. And I remember I made a joke about Tom Kench's tongue lash, and like I said, he licky tongued this other guy or something like that. The and bush. like the crowd like <laughs> lose their mind and like are, are, are laughing, and like that was probably one of the most rewarding moments ever. Like it's just so awesome to like be able to have like a like like get a reaction like that. It's it's I don't know. <laughs> and no, I'm sorry, sure. Twitch chat over here, but it's just not the same. I'm sorry. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm with you 100. percent It's like now my memories are coming back to me. Like IWCA, I don't remember when I cracked a joke yeah. about Marmite and <laughs> having a like Vegemite, it, Vegemite, Vegemite, the, Vegemite that's is the a British one. one. Yeah. Shit, we were talking about yeah. Ricky Gervais. <laughs> <laughs> I probably offended some people out there. Vegemite. No, I think you're all right. I, I tried it right, and I just said, yo, this fucking tastes like the fucking Oceanic Players Tears. And I was like, yeah. just, uh, the, the, It the is very salty. It's very salty. <laughs> and the reaction in those moments, is it's it's uh, addicting. Jesus. Yeah, I, dude. I, I understand. It's, oh, it's so good. How stand-up comedians keep doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it because be. all of the booze then add to the perspective of what those laughs give to you as far as dopamine is concerned. Mm -hmm. Like... I think it's uh i think it's just super duper awesome but it does it creates a lot of different challenges you know um casting online or over the past three years never having a crowd mm. um also casting from a country where you're not the language that's being uh sent out to the crowd right it, it creates a far more sort of almost intimate experience that you have because the majority of the people that are watching are actually by themselves at their pc or watching on their tv or their phone or something like that right and it's actually to the viewer a far more personal experience rather than being in a crowd because in a crowd you know that you're part of a collective mm -hmm. and you feel like part of a collective looking at that red number at the bottom of the twitch box that says a hundred thousand doesn't mm -hmm. make you feel like you're part of a group necessarily and twitch yes, chat yes. can help with that but oftentimes it's just meaningless gobbledygook and craigasms <laughs> that are just going by on the screen and it doesn't create that camaraderie like you don't and especially when it's something like laughter which is a reaction and it's not it's it's not something that you can necessarily fake right like you're gonna laugh if you find something funny and you can't help it often people will laugh by accident you know and that's the, they're my favorites because that's the dad joke laugh it's the laugh we're like <laughs> oh shut up 
you know that's my favorite laugh i don't think there's any laugh that's better than that personally <laughs> it's just just so good but like you don't you, you can't really get that and so like i think that the tone of a broadcast changes and i think that's why a lot of people liked the uh lck broadcast for so long because i think dora and monte cristo are always really really good at casting to a very large amount of people in a way that made it feel like they're just on the couch with them experiencing mm. super good korean league of legends no for sure and that was something that i actually took from uh from their their commentary style from a very very long time i looked up to doa from the beginning of my my career him alongside pastry time and uh of course the legend joe miller mm. um they were sort of the three that i emulated pastry uh, because of a lot of proximity but also like in australia he was like a god in 2012 when i was you know trying to get my foot in the door and so he was always someone that I'd look up to, but Doe was certainly there when it came to like the tone of a broadcast. And I think that that's, it's, it's something that you can't do the same way that you would with a live crowd. Mm. Well, that makes sense. That's, it's, it's, it, it's interesting. It's like what has become evident to me with our conversation is it feels like, like human interaction is like the peak of, of living. Yeah. Hell yeah, dude. It, it, it for sure is. It's like everything That's is why back to there me. is like there is <laughs> never a video game that can have more longevity than one that involves other people's interaction to mm. function, right? People play World of Warcraft for like their whole life, but it's very hard to play Ocarina of Time unless you're speed running it, which does involve other people mm. because you're then comparing your times, right? And you yes, get yes. to talk to other people about this thing. It's the interaction that you get after an achievement that makes it an enjoyable experience because just the experience by itself and patting yourself on the back doesn't give you the same feeling as being able to share it right i think it's uh it's really important in almost everything L let me ask you this now wh when do you think we will have gotten far enough in terms of where technology is that the distinction between what is an actual human interaction like in person, for example, we are talking online. I see you, right? Mm. I, I, this this is very human, right? But there's, there's, yeah, there there yeah. would be a certain element if we were in the same room. It would be you know a lot more intimate. It would be a lot more human, right? Do you think I'd that... interrupt you less? <laughs> no, no, no worries about it. I haven't felt it at all. Um, in a world where, how far away do you think we are from like technology recreating the the full human experience in a virtual reality? Oh, that's a toughie. You know, like, what is it? The Steven Spielberg movie, the Ready Player One or whatever, yes. which was basically that. You know, you've got Metaverse by Mr. Plastic Face. Um, <laughs> that, one, that one seems ultimately terrifying, but seems to be a thing that's uh, catching on. I think that we're probably a lot closer than we expect, right? Like, I don't know how we're going to solve the, you know, faster than light problem with the yeah. internet always having ping. Um, but I think we, uh, I think we're, we're terrifyingly close to a black mirror episode being actually our life. It's kind of and, scary. Uh, huh? Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. And when you like having watched black mirror actually makes me more scared mm -hmm. because so much of what they do, you can completely understand that human nature would react that way. And often it leads to really awful and and horrible things happening and the breakdown of society and stuff like that. And so like, I don't know, man, I'm scared. But I want another season of Black Mirror because that show is too good. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, it's like everything is about better, quicker, faster. Uh, like to, to get the gratification and yeah, I feel like no one. It's it's impossible to know the consequences. It's like yeah. how would the world look like today if there was no internet? So imagine the man who just thought of internet, who I have actually met, but <laughs> really? I don't remember his name. He, oh, he, like we were, you we, should Google it. I reckon it's probably there. Uh, screw it. Doesn't matter. He, he, <laughs> he won't listen to this. Uh, basically, I was have, at an event called Berlin Campus Party, and we there was a League of Legends tournament there for some reason. But there was like a lot of lecturers there. Like the the, the main arena was just okay. lecturers, and he was lecturing the man who. Uh, apparently created the internet and i'm just thinking what what would the world look like if if that event like that thing didn't occur because it's impossible to know the consequences of what the internet um has brought forth it's like yeah 
the, the world would be completely different. Like, whoa, I can't even begin to imagine. And then it's like, there's, I don't there's, know, I... there's probably like these next guys, right? That, that are equally smart as this dude that I will never be as smart as they, the, the, the innovators, you know, that, that, that are truly pushing. It's like, imagine there's a bunch of people that are also at the same time trying to find the next thing that is going to push humanity to a new era completely. It's wormholes, by the way. That's the next thing. I reckon wormholes. that's the next one. Tell me about yeah, wormholes. Yeah, like fast, faster than light travel. That's that's the next thing. Okay. There's, uh, it's, it's fascinating um, what people are trying to do. Bro, I don't mind flying. Like um, it's not too bad. <laughs> like like I, I, I don't mind the twelve-hour yeah, flight. Yeah, what if you could? What if you could fly to Alpha Centauri and be on a beach that's green, uh, with green sand, or and like you know, and it's uh, Alpha Centauri. I don't think is actually habitable, but I think there are like planets around it that are theoretically in the habitable zone. But like being able to actually be a uh, spacefaring nation, I think is probably going to be the next thing that's as big as the internet. I mm. think. Because I don't think, like, as far as, like, changing humanity on that scale, I don't think that you could have something that big. Because the internet, with the way that it's connected so many people together, like, I don't think there is a way to revolutionize the human condition more than, than that outside of, yeah, have another Earth that you can go to, you know? Mm. That's scary. It's like imagine. Yeah. I, I wonder if if that ever occurs. If if things somehow, it's like if if everything is figured out, will things get boring then? Because there's there's like this in my mind the idea of not knowing is also part of the journey, and it's like the journey no, is always the like the the fun part, right? It's like you arrive. It's like do you get bored? Yeah. But it should be impossible to uh, get yeah. bored, right? I think like, and probably what's going to happen before that is just the world's going to be taken over by AI, right? Mm. Doesn't AI just just end up ruling the world? And I don't know, humans are just doing completely irrelevant stuff because it's actually like robots and AI that are running the entire planet. There's a, there's a lot of very scary things that could potentially <laughs> uh, turn out. But thankfully, I don't know whether we'll have to worry about it. But, um, you know, you, the younger generation might have to be a little bit frightened about where things are going. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I feel think... like we've gotten very existential at the end of this conversation, and it's making me happy. Maybe maybe it's like, what, what, what if... <laughs> I, I could imagine it's like if, 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 if the Fortnite kids need to, like, fight off aliens and ai they're gonna like be teabagging robots and shit <laughs> they're gonna be jumping <laughs> and, and, like, doing dances and shit. <laughs> yeah. And the next big argument is like whether or not a robot's allowed to compete in the uh, in the Olympics, you know. And it's like AI has gotten so good at replicating humans and how they work that actually, like, we're having a big argument. And this the AI is like up there on the stand saying, "I just want to compete too. I've got my own dreams and aspirations." Like that is that is just that's just going to be the thing. That's that's what's going to happen <laughs> for sure. I don't know. Oh, and man. I'm like, I'm not necessarily talking about like AI, like um rudimentary ai that can build a car and stuff like that at like the tesla factory i'm talking about like ai people you know walking around living their own lives and having consciousness and crap oh it's just scary man super scary oh man watching uh i watched what was it uh deus ex machina mm. if that's how you pronounce it that's how I decided to pronounce it that time. It's not how I pronounce it every time. Um, <laughs> that that movie is absolutely fantastic as far as like a representation of how to feel when it does finally happen, right? I don't know. I think it's awesome. I actually need to watch it. I've I've heard this movie I guess being Blade Runner so many times. Blade Runner is definitely a good uh, example of it as well. Hmm. It's exactly that question, right? Of can anything that's manufactured ever actually have that level of consciousness and feeling and then in that instance when do they deserve you know the same rights that you know you have as a human and all that sort of stuff cool yeah. questions that's spooky reminds me yeah. like blade runner I, I remember this movie with uh, joaquin phoenix too where he had like this artificial girlfriend and... oh her yes. god i love that movie scarlett johansson's voice in that movie was just incredible yeah, was, I don't the, know. It was, it was amazing. Strange because I didn't know what to expect when I started watching it, but then I was like, "Oh man!" At the end of it, it was just 
it's it's crazy if, if if it gets to that point where it's like every like synapse in our body that you know releases some form of gratification that feels good if it gets to that point where everything becomes so easily accessible you know and then it's like humans yeah, are just going like to be sitting synthesized. yeah we're just going to be sitting there and our experience won't will be so unreal that we are not going to be we we will cease to exist altogether and everything that we ever wanted is just a button press yeah yeah and actually the matrix they got it right but it's like the way that it happens is all of the humans just volunteer to go into the pods mm. you know they just we're happy to because all of our needs get met right like yeah. hey, ay, ay, ay. what do you think the, it, you know. the most likely way the world is going to go under <laughs> that's a dark question but uh, <laughs> interesting question <laughs> Um, it's, it's already sort of started, hasn't it? Um, you know, if you watch David Attenborough's movie about why the whole planet's going to explode, mm -hmm. you know, we'll have enough ice melt so that half the planet gets flooded, but also the biggest problem is then currents change. And then when the currents change, you have like all sorts of catastrophic shifts when it comes to the, you know, the, 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 the world, it, it, apparently it's avoidable. Mm -hmm. from information that I got relatively recently from a source that I don't know whether I can trust, but I was told and by the algorithm that we're not all going to die <laughs> imminently, uh, which is nice. We should probably keep recycling, but, you know, uh, we're not all going to die immediately. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think that we, we will probably kill the planet eventually. I don't think the humans can really be trusted to stop being greedy. I feel like the the whole climate crisis has been marketed very wrong it's like we have to save mother earth no we need to maybe save mankind you know it's like if people had it a little bit close to home like no one cares about the like planet it's like people only care about themselves most of the time so if, if yeah. it was marketed in a way it's like yo you're gonna be fucked you will be fucked because mother earth is gonna be here it's like humans might be extinct the mother Earth's gonna be here chilling you know we're gonna make some mm. new species evolution is gonna you know maybe then the next humans are gonna have three heads or something and they will think of <laughs> you know and they will three heads are better than one you mother <laughs> that's called an upgrade <laughs> <laughs> something like I, I don't know too much about um evolution uh, theory but i think the marketing of it was was a bit off you know i think everyone, yeah, everyone I, just cares about themselves you know but also everyone only cares about the like the imminent and the present right like and all of what fixing climate change does is fixes things for people in the future that you don't know and don't care about and i think a lot of people struggle to resonate with caring about that because they're like well i'll be dead hmm. so you know and yeah. that's an awful way to think right and i think a lot of us are like oh god that's disgusting like how could you ever think that way but you also like i think that that is probably a likely way that a lot of us and like some like sometimes you forget that you know climate change is a thing like i think everyone's it's not one of those things that's just constantly present breathing down your neck right the same thing can be said for something like you know covid and the amount of people that were like protesting against covid when we knew that it was a thing and it existed and there were people that were like no it doesn't exist because i don't like it I would prefer it doesn't exist. And therefore, I'm going to say that it doesn't exist because that suits the reality that I want to live in. Yes, and yes. it's, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's sort of one of those type things. But, you know, climate change is further away and less immediately dangerous. And so if, if like, that's the reaction to, like, a pandemic, then, like, how, how the fuck are you supposed to reconcile climate change? I feel, aye, aye. I feel like so many decisions nowadays i feel like the society has been built in a way where the faster it's it's like every like any p any piece of innovation is just pushed in the direction that human beings have the possibility to get gratification faster it's like faster 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 it's like now mm. with, with with our phone right next to us it's like we we have access to everything everything is so quick it's like you want to order something you can have it here today you want to buy some food you can have it here today everything is so instant and we uh, everything is about the quick fix and the quick reward and 
I feel like anything that takes that has an impact over long term, the, the, the void of that uh, due to minds being very oversaturated with with information, it's such a it's it, it's just not there. It's like the news cycle is always 24, 24 hours. It's like this big shit yep. just happened, headline everywhere. Then the next day, no one fucking remembers. The next day, the the queen of uh, Zimbabwe got married or some shit. I'm just making some shit up. <laughs> and then it's like, that's, and, that, <laughs> and then that's the headline. It's like everything is just so instant and quick, and nothing is ever viewed uh, over the long term. But then, like, the thing that scares me about that, right, is like you're exactly right, and everything has become like the instant gratification, instant gratification. Mm. But but then that becomes the norm, and then that's not fast enough. And then you need it to be quicker again. Then you need it. It's like everything's perspective. Even the speed of things is perspective. Like you expect to go from like, you know, Germany to South Korea, for example, like back in the day, you'd be like, that's five months and boats and walking yes, yes. and all that sort of <laughs> shit. Right. And that would be for that person. Like, look at how fucking far we've gone. Mm. It's amazing. This is incredible. And now we're getting pissed off because it takes 17 hours and we have a layover in Dubai that we didn't feel like we needed, you know, <laughs> like, like everything is all based on like what the expectation is and then what happens, right? Like, mm. I think it's just, uh, and I, I think that the, that human beings are very, very good at tolerating a thing that they know they have to deal with. But as soon as you suggest that there is an easier way no one tolerates that shit There's anymore. There's no going back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, the, the, like, I think the, the most common advice I've given to people is just, it's like, try doing nothing. It's like, one hour, just do nothing. See how you react. And Live with your own brain. I find it very difficult. It I is, just don't it, shut up, and I get annoying. It's 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 challenging because we're so used to being occupied. It's like our attention is always occupied because that's what every major company is battling for, everyone's attention, right? It's like our attention is a very important resource. And um, it's like when you try to reset your attention and just see where your mind goes, this is where a lot of introspection happens. And at the same time, we can begin to rehab rehabilitate ourselves somehow, you know? It's, yeah, uh, and and gives you the ability to reorganize what's happening in your brain. It's sort of like file formatting for your brain. Mm. And I think it is very very important. I don't do enough of it. Um, I have long showers, mm. and that I use for reformatting the brain. But I don't need to be having a shower. It's just a time where, like, I don't trust the waterproof nature of my telephone, right? Mm. And so therefore, I am just spending time by myself, and I very much enjoy showers. Mm. Um, which, you know, I try to cut short now because water is something that you don't want to waste. Um, but that is, that was when I first, that's why shower thoughts exist. Because yes. you get, like, it's the last bastion of just being there and not being overly stimulated, right? And I guess, you know, there are places that have TVs in their shower. But Bro, our absurd. phones, are tr they're trying to get in there. It's like every phone, yeah. waterproof. It's waterproof, <laughs> but but yeah, people are still yeah. skeptical enough, you know, to be like, ah, yeah, thank God, yeah, finally we, we can still think a little bit in the shower. I'm oh, waiting God. for the first phone to be like, this is shampoo proof as well. It's shampoo proof. <laughs> it's soap proof. <laughs> it's <a> fucking, <laughs> and they were screwed. Then there's no yeah. no peace. Yeah, as soon in as life it's ever. shampoo proof, that's when I know that the world <laughs> has gone in a direction I don't agree with. No more shampoo. Not about cuts. it. No shampoo. Br I'm going to let's send a message to Samsung or Apple or something like that and ask them about it. Because <laughs> maybe they're working on it right now. Gonna, I could pop over. You know? like, I, think the, I think the factory is like two hours away. I'll get there. Oh, man. Sounds great. It's, it's, and, and often it's like if, 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 if you don't like being with your own thoughts, usually there is something there, you know, that needs to be yep. addressed. And I think that's important too. Because I think it's so easy to, to, to build, to, to let something build up and stack up for a longer period of time because we don't address, because we always have an opportunity to distract ourselves. It's crazy. Yeah. Like these apps are so dangerous. It's like, I go take a shit, I open TikTok, and then all of a sudden that <laughs> fucking shit that I'm taking, you know, is just fucking taking an hour. 
and I'm just I didn't yeah. get anything out of it. I watch. Well, some... I mean, you get shit out of it. <laughs> I get shit out of it, and I drive yeah. ass because I'm fucking watching TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fucking disaster. And then it's like I watch I watch three cooking recipes. I saw someone do squats, and I saw some Ninja yeah. Warrior clip. I saw three cats, two <laughs> dogs, and it's like, what did I get, really get out of it? You know, it's like my mind was just yeah. I was hypnotized. I was in a different dimension. It's 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 insanity. You know. No, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. That's why now but, I'm trying you know, to like some, protect some my of those, attention. Some yeah. of those videos are great. I've actually stayed off TikTok. I've I'm I, I feel like I'm Me just too. too old. I feel like I'm too old. It was like Snapchat. Snapchat came around and I was like, uh, I don't know. I can't really get amongst this one either. Same. But I think that might be my age talking just a little bit. But TikTok is like that's yeah, I don't know. Can't get there. Just I just can't. It's just not not my thing. Well, it's 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 insanity. It's like sometimes it's like for for me when I open TikTok, it's like what what the fuck am I watching? This is so stupid. <laughs> and then I just keep watching it, you know. It's like when sometimes my girlfriend watches like some of these shows. It's like uh, mm -hmm. like some uh, they're they're talking through a wall. They haven't met each other. They're just talking, and then they're supposed to agree to marry each other. Yeah, I watched that. I watched a bit of that show. I watched a bit of that show. And My whenever, fiance was watching it, and I, I was like, "This is stupid." And then yes. I think I watched like sixteen episodes yes. or something. Yes, <laughs> it's hypnosis. What, 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 what happens there? It's like this is so yeah. stupid. What am I yeah. to do? Horse riding? It's okay. Because we, we love, we love watching things that we feel like we're superior of, and then mm. judging them. I think that that is actually like, it's a, it's a thing. That is definitely a thing. I feel like I was definitely targeted, you know, when I was watching that and they like they try and make people look as stupid as possible so you yes. can be as frustrated as possible and they want to watch how stupid they are in the next episode, mm. you know, and things like this. Like, I don't know. I think it's, uh, yeah. I wonder if that's the whole model of it, like though. TLC, you know? It's like, yeah. I, I sometimes I get like recommends like this woman eats eight rolls of toilet paper every day and I was like, I have to watch this. How can I not watch this? <laughs> <laughs> so there's no I know, way it was, it was it was really interesting though because uh you know mukbang has been a huge thing here in korea for a really long time just watching people sorry eat, i just right? love the transition <laughs> no 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 please but continue like, it, no, no 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 i i i i you know i barely I try, i'm tr we're trying to move on right <laughs> um but my uh my fiance would watch a lot of these mukbang videos mm like before bed right and uh she recently uh did a photo shoot with a couple of her friends and got the most ridiculously shredded like it was insane um okay. but she was watching mukbang videos so that she wouldn't want to eat more because she's like a bit of a fiend for you know eating too much chocolate mm. every now and again and so instead she just watches other people eat chocolate and vicariously does it through them oh and I've, I've always thought of like, if I was to watch someone eat, I just, it's inspiring. But instead, <laughs> they're like, instead of like being inspired to eat themselves, they're like, yes, this is what fuels me. I now just watch people eating and that is my weight loss plan. Mm. Because I'll just say that this is my meal. It's like, well, uh, what did you have for lunch today, darling? Uh, I, I watched someone have a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> far less calories you know yeah i need to try it was, this it was it was very interesting it was very interesting because to me it sounded completely insane mm. when i first heard about it and now it's you know i sometimes watch it with her you know it kind of makes sense though yeah 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 it, I, I, I need mean, to try she, it she was down to like uh just above 10 percent body fat oh shit Okay. And uh, I think for women, that is absurdly low. Okay. Because I think it's different for men and women based on how the bodies work. Okay. But yeah, she was, she was definitely, I was, I was extraordinarily impressed. Holy moly. Um, and I, I was like, I'd, I'd sit next to her as like, you know, this relatively chunky Australian dude. I'm like, I am starting to feel a little bit inadequate. Oh God. <laughs> yes. Oh, and Prue, thank you very much for being here first. And uh, it's good to have that that is indeed low. But it looked low. Like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. She was gorgeous, but it was it was just like it was a bit too shredded. It was intimidating. <laughs> yeah. No, I've been doing thanks, Mark Pong. Gets you there. 
it's like I, I tried uh, uh, well I, I did the three day fast and it got crazy it's like I started dreaming about food and it was so <laughs> vivid it was so it was the the food was so delicious in the dream and in the mm-hmm. dream I was in a loop I kept catching myself I was like yo I'm I'm uh, I'm, e- I'm fasting I'm not allowed to eat and I was like oh I'm dreaming oh, and God, I went no. back to eating and then I just it was a loop just kept looping. I, I ate like the cheesiest fucking pizza ever. Oh. It was just like you know what the one that you fucking you you take up and then it's just fucking it's like a long fucking thing. It just thing keeps hanging going out, forever you know? just, and ever and you ever. You have to like yeah, loop yeah. it around and like ooh. So mm-hmm. and then you give up and you just decide to fucking. And you have the giant anyway. then chunk of cheese at the beginning. Yes, and it's amazing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I completely know what you mean. Yes, yes. No, oh, for sure. And pizza in Korea has really improved. I think over the last like few years and so now i can get my pizza fix it was one of the things that people didn't like about going to korea is that pizza was weird and there is still definitely some pizza that is not traditional mm. but there are amazing places to get pizza now not there used nice. to be a lot of things that korea didn't do well food wise but now seoul is just good at everything mm. and it, it's it's really frustrating because you're like i i'd go back to australia and i'm like cherry let me show you all of these great restaurants and for all of the types of cuisine that I would be taking her to, there's like a better one in Seoul. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Not fair. Ugh. Oh, shit. I wanted to anyway, ask that you. Three days of fasting I've never done before in my life. And I, I, I do not envy that process. I should probably try it, though. It was interesting. Genuinely, I was drinking water and coffee and, and tea. Like, don't, don't stay away from, from water. I, I, I kept saying I was doing a water fast. I was like, Yamato, you're crazy. You're not drinking water. It's like, no, I'm only drinking water. And I had to keep repeating this. So I'm just saying it now too. It's like just drinking water is is, is, is definitely uh, essential. But I'm going to try the, the, yeah, the, yeah. the mukbang technique because it makes sense. It's like, it's, like I, watch, yeah. I watch criminal shows because I'm living out the fantasy of being like a big top mafia boss. <laughs> that I will never yeah, ever yeah, do, yeah. right? Because I wouldn't want to like murder anyone, right? It's like I'm watching Narcos. Yep. It's like Pablo. It's like, hey, tu plumo. And it's like I'm watching mm-hmm. to live through, live the fantasy of like the, the, the police side and everything. I'm not, never going to do that shit. So I want to try the mukbang yeah. technique. That's fucking brilliant. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's not too bad. It's, it's the right kind of uh, exercising your empathy. You know, like you can do that. Um, don't do it with American Psycho, for example. Mm. You know, don't be a psychopath. Probably a bad <laughs> idea. Um, depraved lunatic by the way i do need to clear up um because she was gorgeous then she's even more gorgeous now boom okay? that's that's what i meant boom because sometimes you get like i don't know anyway i, I yeah i just wanted to clear that up I want i've gotten trouble i wanted before. to ask you brother i'm hmm. curious so basically what, what the fuck is happening with the oceanic region so what's what's going oh, on beats me dude i haven't been back there in three years <laughs> You don't have like the ear to the ground. Like, what, what's going on there? Like, what, 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 what went well, so wrong? Because I have well, homies Riot over there. sort of backed out because they were unable to actually penetrate the market. Like, there just wasn't okay. enough people that were getting interested quickly enough. Okay. Um, or something like that. Uh, I think that it was probably something that they decided on. It just wasn't like the economic future probably was deemed not going to be there. Okay. And so Riot moved out. Um, it's really good that the ESL uh, picked it up. And I think with the LCO, like, I don't see too many differences between the LCO and what the OPL was. Mm. And so um, I actually think the Oceanic region as a whole is probably just going to keep going, right? It hasn't been Heroes of the Storm, you know? Okay. <laughs> because, like, it still exists, right? Whereas Heroes of the Storm was, like, lynched, you know, in a yes. parking lot. The oceanic region it was just one of the owners moved out it's a very different story you know no okay. stabbing took place and they're they're still alive um and you know thankfully you know all of my mates back there are still you know doing fantastic things if they haven't all just like moved elsewhere that used to be that australia would be the export nation of commentators and now it's the export nation of coaches like general managers of like everything like so many of the the players from top oceanic teams over the last eight years or nine years right have all moved into a lot of these leadership roles not only in um oceania itself but also overseas and stuff like that and Mm. it's uh it's really really cool like just watching some of the guys that 
you know, I'd go out with to bars after lands that were held in university halls and shit like this, <laughs> you know, and like have beers with. And now they're, you know, making lots of money working for, you know, huge organizations and stuff like that. Like, I just think it's uh, it's absolutely crazy um, just how far everyone's come. So it's it's I think it was a shame that Riot moved out, but I also kind of understand why it happened. Mm. And uh, I think that ESL is in a better position to run it rather than what, you know, Riot was uh, was capable of doing, I think, with uh, the ties that they had to the company. Okay. Well, that's good enough for me. I wanted to... I mean, that's, that's to... my perspective now because I, I, okay. I haven't been that close to it, but that's that's what my perspective is now. Okay, okay. I have, I have some homies that keep telling me I keep telling me that uh, like the, the the challenger solo queue ladder is kept hostage because there's so few players, and then it's like people there's, a, there's just like a group of people like streaming how they're trolling games and no one really gives a shit about it. It's like the wild wild west, uh, the the challenger solo queue of, of of Australia. But nevertheless, yeah, I mean, I I, th I think that's a whole different story, right? And yeah, as soon yeah. as we start exporting all of our talent elsewhere, like who's going to be left behind and there's actually just not much of an opportunity for that. But that comes from just not having enough people that are playing at that level, mm -hmm. right? And the only way for that to improve is to increase the amount of people that are actually talented enough, right? Yes, yes. I, I think that like that's that's a geographical problem and not a what has Oceania done about this? Mm. Like you can't you can't do anything. Like our country's like mostly desert. Like <laughs> what you gonna do, man? <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay. Atlas, I was thinking we head into Twitter questions. I have some homies. Okay. That, uh, oh, shit. It's been two hours, it's, dude. It's been two hours. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> I don't yeah, know how long I, I can it, keep it's you. It's almost midnight. I got I to gotta, I gotta call my fiance before she has to go to bed. Oh, my God. So we, we All just, right. Let's we, get into Twitter we, questions. Let's do uh, it. We just do some quick questions. I'm going to yeah, let yeah. you. You have the floor, okay? Uh, okay? First question from Stop Bothering Us. With a like that Power name. Ranger with a thick booty as a, as a picture. Is Chovy a worse knight? Thoughts? I think this question's really dumb. Mm. Um, there has been... There was actually a video Midbase did recently of Chovy versus knight, actually. It was a Zoe versus Rise matchup, I think, in mid lane. Mm -hmm. I think both of them are really great players. I think they're great players for different reasons. But I do think that the way Chovy manages the nuances and micro interactions of the laning phase are a little bit better but i think knight is very good at exploiting the state of the game especially early um in order to get things like he thinks like a killer the way that he gets around the map and takes control i think he's fantastic at that whereas chovy is very very good at sort of like it's almost like the honorable knight you know like he even though that's sort of the other side uh oops but I think that Chovy is very good at playing within, you know, what is the technically 2v2 of the mid lane, right? And playing around what are those confines. Whereas Knight spends his whole time working out how to get out of them and mm. win elsewhere and stuff like that. Whilst also having amazing laning fundamentals and things like that. But I think that there is a slightly different mindset between the two players. But I think they're both fantastic. No, for Chovy's sure. better, obviously, because he's Korean. But I have <laughs> to say that because I'm from the LCK. No, for sure. No, I'm with you on that. I think it's like it's always that development with most mid laners throughout their career. It's like first they come out, they are insane laners. I think Chovy is definitely on the more extreme end, probably the best laner yeah. that has ever played the game. And then they they recognize the patterns they need to do in order to to win games. It was the same with Showmaker. He was like only laning, and now he knows how to win with the help of of others more and more so. And the same with Faker. Yeah. I remember Faker. Uh, like he was blessed in season three that his teammates just realized oh he's fucking good i'm just gonna go to him and things good things will happen but it was the same thing like he was just a fucking laning genius and then eventually it branches out to to understand like the depths of of the game right so so yeah. for sure I'm, I'm with you and at night i believe they've played have they played a similar length i guess they have but we can move on um i think light night's been playing for maybe a little bit longer What's I know sure? that there were talks about Knight even when I was back in the LPL mm. um, as this like young prodigy uh, yeah. for a very long time. But I think he he didn't really come into the 
2016 until after I left, which would have been about 2017, and it was 2018 that Chovy came in. So I guess, I guess it's probably about the same. Okay. Next question, brother, from Steven. What would be your okay. favorite storylines coming into the MSI? Hmm. A lot of big ones. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, obviously, my favorite one is can uh, T1 uh, stay undefeated? Ooh. That's my favorite one. 10 0 in group stage is a big ask. And that's the one. Is it? I mean, Longju was able to do it. Is that oh, a that's team true. That's better than this T1? Don't think so. That's true. They didn't even win the tournament. <laughs> they still <laughs> went perfect in groups. Gee. Okay. Yeah. I think I think that I think groups is actually going to be I mean, especially based on what we've seen thus far of uh where things are seated. Um groups is gonna be very I think it it'll be comfortable. I think that oh actually I think the whole tournament's gonna be very comfortable. Mm. Um Okay. But I think that there are there are a lot of opportunities for second places, especially in the first uh three groups that we've seen released. Um plus a lot of the a lot of the rivalries, the fact that we've got Oceania, uh, North America, and Europe in the same group is just absolutely hilarious to me. And so, like, that whole thing, like, makes me so happy. Mm. Oh, it's very, very cool. Um, and I want to see, like, how good Evil Geniuses are actually going to be at Worlds as well, because there weren't a whole lot of people that were expecting them to make their way in. And I didn't follow the story that closely, but, you know... I'd like for the, you know, for North America not to be in the bin again. Because it's just, it's starting to get old, you know? Well, that's true. I felt like last year it was, they didn't do too shabby, though. Like, all things considered, TL almost got through groups. And then C9 yeah. did the thing. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful I wanna, I wanna, What I mean is, I, I want to see, like, my dream is for the semifinals to have four regions in it. Hmm. That's that's what I want to see because we just don't really get that very much. Yes, yes. You know, and as a LCK representative, I was pretty happy to have three out of the four, right? But I don't think that that means that. I don't think that's great. Mm. You know, I like getting excited for any team to be able to win. Yes, and yes. Yeah, it's, we're we're not quite there yet. For me, just to add as a caveat, I am hyped for just Jahu. Uh, looking for his uh, third title. I think, I think it's hype that oh RNG God, gets to defend. You know, I, I think it's hype that uh, RNG yep. gets to defend. I think that the three mid layers each like top region is sending is 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 fucking exciting. It's very cool. I like. I it. I actually love the RNG T1 matchup in so many ways. Like there are so many just awesome things to look at between those two teams. Mm. Um, I've been a Xiaohu fan for about forever. The first two selfies I ever got with um, players outside of Australia was one with Xiaohu and one with Koma. Mm. And I guess he's not a he's not a, a player but a coach. But they're they're like that's sort of the two that I went out of my way to get. I've uh, I've been a huge Xiaohu fan for for about forever. And watching him face off against Zayas and I don't know, it's just and and Faker and just the really the the the, the cool combination of like the other guy that has been around forever versus faker just i don't know makes me so happy plus it's it's rng right it's starhorn royal club come back for revenge there's been like one time in one tournament when they have a winning record against t1 and it was a best of one at rift rivals or something like that mm. like to like that that's that's a lot of revenge that's been stored up right so i think it'll be really really fun it's going to be a great msi final when RNG get 3 0 by T1. <laughs> All right. Next question. Uh, Peter Varga, which is one of our uh, fanatic uh, folk, he's the research mm -hmm. and analytics engineer. Uh, he's uh, very excited about this episode. Uh, when casting okay. international events, he asks, does his preparation routine change? Is he more nervous? What tournament matchup would be his dream to cast? That's a couple of questions. You just wow, take, that's take a cool one. Take whatever you, wherever you want to go. Um, yes and no, in a lot of ways. I like to keep routine uh, for international events, but also there, there's a new factor when you go international that is much more important than a lot of other things, right? Because League of Legends is being discussed to death because you're traveling to 
commentate this tournament with a whole lot of other people that are going to be working in this tournament as well. You're obviously going to talk about it all day, every day. That's not a problem, but you're casting with so many different people. And one of the things that's the most important to have within any broadcast is familiarity with each other. And that's what you have to do and you have to make sure you upkeep it a lot, which is getting to know the people you're going to be working with prior. Mm. And so a lot of time needs to be spent on, you know, just hanging out and doesn't need to happen um, for, for someone like myself who's been in the space for a very long time um as much but there are a lot of people that i haven't worked with as much right like cadrill i'm still waiting you know um to to cast with him and that would require you know a fair bit of work right like i remember back to oh, i don't even remember remember which uh which worlds it was but i was casting with crepo for one of the first times and he works very differently to anybody else this guy was like he was an absolute machine like he would take us aside and like explain like how everything is going to go and we're going to have like this hand signal system for who's going to speak and when they're going to speak and I want to talk more about this exact stuff and you're going to talk more about this exact stuff and I'm going to talk like he just takes control in this beautiful way. It was it was amazing casting with Crepo. I just wind mm. him up and he'd just go. <laughs> and the man's brain was just so huge. I miss him a lot actually. Um, thankfully got to hang out with him uh one of the more recent times that i was in germany although i guess that was like four years ago or something like that mm. um but there was a there was a final question and i can't remember what it was he also asked um what tournaments and matchup would his dream w w like what would be the dream match oh dream to cast yeah which matchup i oh, guess you can God. choose any point in history as well you could just drag and drop Oh, okay. Um, KT versus IG 2018, if it was the final. That's my dream matchup. Ooh. That was the real final, I think, I think yeah. in my opinion. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, me too. But I also, like, I love both of those teams a lot. And I don't know, just every every player on those teams excites me. So that's probably my dream. I'd like the result to be different. Bro, I'm so um, I'm so silly. I get I get goosebumps just from the mention of the series. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, that's, oh my that's god, that's where I'm at. Oh, yeah, okay. and it's it's not nothing against Fnatic, and I apologize um, to to any any Fnatic fans that might watch the the Fnatic coach talking to me about this. Um, mm -hmm. I just I, they were my two personal favorite teams at the time, um, and definitely is nothing against Fnatic as a team at all. And no, they 100% deserve to be in that final, of course. Yes, yes. Oh, a Fnatic, they, they got first place in the group. I think that's uh, that's the that, that, that's the big thing. So, yeah. If, if they didn't, they would have to face KT. And then maybe everything would look different. You know, that would be crazy. Maybe. That was a that was a wacky year. Like the the, the knockouts, man. Like, whoa. Bro, I, still I, I, I still can't believe I, like we beat Genji twice, RNG, and then we lose to C9 twice. We threw yeah. 10k gold leads against C9 twice. I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I, I, I yeah. keep, keep rewatching those games sometimes when, you know, when I'm, I'm, it's like the equivalent. When you're like, searching for answers. I'm like, it's like, Can I'm, I find I'm, answers here? It's like in the fucking the Da Vinci Code when that guy is like whipping himself. That's like me, me rewatching those games. Oh, God. <laughs> I know, I like. I had that as soon as you said that. I had that scene in my mind, but it was your face. <laughs> I'm sorry for imagining your butt. Um, <laughs> they're pretty sure his butt was in the scene. Okay, I forgot that part. But you have an app. You just have an eye for details. <laughs> <laughs> an eye for butts. Yeah, there we go. That's what they say about me. Actually, yeah, yeah, they definitely do. He this gets one's... his butt out a lot, that guy. I've forgotten what his name is. He gets his butt out in another movie. Now I'm proving the point, which I don't want to do. Let's go to the next question. <laughs> uh, Vartian Reznor asks uh, an interesting question. I have a follow-up question to it. Uh, your mm -hmm. opinion on LCK casters not getting the proper recognition and cast more international events. What's your stance? I think we cast a lot of international events, and I think we get a lot of recognition. Where have you been reading stuff? I think we're doing fine. Because my follow-up <laughs> would be, like, how did it feel to cast the World Fucking Finals? Oh, my God. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Bro, I, uh, it, was, it was weird 
because it was a world final, but it was also in basically what felt like an empty LEC studio. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I struggled with a lot was getting to the right energy for the series. Mm -hmm. I think we did, and it's very easy with with Kobe and, and Bettius, right? Like in a TriCast as a play-by-play -play, in that moment, like I don't even... I have to I have to try to make sure that like my small moments are memorable mm. and I also have to not try to do that. Because okay. if if a tricast is dominated by the play by play, I think that it's a less rich listening experience. And so every fiber of my being wanted to solo cast the whole series, right? Mm -hmm. But to to have to rein that in not to 50% like you would in a duo cast but to 33% and actually probably closer to 30 cuz you go more of a 30 40 40 um in a tri cast like that mm. that's like that was the hugest challenge um and also doesn't leave you feeling like like I felt like I had so much more to say after that series right but I'm not the guy that's doing that I'm not necessarily the narrative driver um, hundred percent of the time. Right. Mm. And we have to go with conversations that the three of us are going to be having about this sort of stuff. Right. And make sure that the flow of the series is working effectively. And a lot of that is taken care of, of like between Vettius and Kobe bouncing off one another. And then me building on that to get to their next point that obviously they wanted to talk about. Right. Um, I think that I conducted it relatively well, but it's still a bit of a blur in my mind, man. Like the, the fact that it even happened is uh just mind-blowing to me and i'm so appreciative to actually have the uh the opportunity 20 40 40 sorry sorry my, my math is not great um i, I thought that, how no, that being said we always cast every day to 110 percent um <laughs> i thought how, yeah, like, how it happened how to just yo we're gonna fly in atlas for the fucking finals I thought that was <laughs> yeah. fucking baller, man. I thought that was. I thought that I was pretty good at not being horrendously jet lagged after only being in Germany for a day and a half. That was what I was <laughs> proud of. <laughs> oh man, it actually Ooh. reminds me of the story. I was in, uh, I, like, they flew me back for the finals uh, in Korea, 2018. They just wanted to have like a U European representative uh, there. I, yeah, I believe. yeah. And I, I the was freezing desk, wasn't it? The freezing desk. Yes, it was yes. Very cold up it was there. Very fucking. Oh wait, cold. no, was it? It was. It was pretty cold. I don't but, know. But we had like okay, years okay. and shit. Like, uh, no, we had no reasons to complain. Uh, I, I went to a barber shop, right? I took out my hair, mm. and I was just I, like, just making making conversation. Yeah, I'm jet lagged. I didn't sleep so well. And then he's like, "Yo, yeah. you want something for that?" I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Yeah, I have Xanax. You want Xanax?" <laughs> just gives he just he just gave me Xanax. I was like, "Bro, do, do I need to pay you for for this?" He's like, "No, and man. That's why I'm he not went a to Sandbox. I'm, I'm not a drug dealer." He said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was it. And then I just kept yeah. them. And then because of this fucking song, Sicker Mode, I yep. decided to keep them for the flight, you know? <laughs> and, that, and, that, and, and that flight was, was, maybe I shouldn't be sharing the story, but that flight was, mm -hmm. was, was a blessing. And that was the day mm -hmm. I sworn Xanax off for the rest of my life. I'm never going to touch that shit again because it was... Yeah, definitely a good idea. A little bit too nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dangerous shit. Don't live like that, Yamato. We need you as aware as possible, okay? <laughs> I don't want you floating, you know, when I'm when I'm having a chat with you next time. That's not what that's not what we're about. <laughs> Speaking of, the next question, which has nothing okay. to do with Xanax. <laughs> DMO asks, from your experience in casting, what would you say your biggest strength has become? Ooh, that's a fantastic question. My, what my biggest strength has become. Mm. Wow, I've never had that question before. I've had the obvious one, which is, what do you think your biggest strength is? And I'm like, my Australian accent. But that was always <laughs> my strength. What has my biggest strength become? I think, oh man, that's a tough one. I think the thing that I'm most proud of, and I guess this is probably the only thing that I can really speak to, right? Because that's the thing that I've been trying to build and trying to work in as much as possible hmm. um i guess what i'm most proud of in the way that i commentate is tone and being able to carry the tone of a broadcast in the way that is appropriate for me and whoever i'm commentating with so hmm. that it feels natural 
like connecting the two commentators in a way that shows that we're on a similar level. I think that's what I've been proud of throughout most of my career. And I've been very lucky, right? Because I've had uh, phenomenal co-casters the whole way there. And I learned so much from Spawn, from Papa, uh, from Wolf, even from Valdez, and even chronically, even though he's, uh, he's he's very new to the casting scene, like Wolf and I casted Overwatch, of course, um, back in the day. So our, our experience goes a little, little bit longer, but learning and being able to adapt these really smart people's like opinions and their strengths has been something that I've been very proud of, I guess. Mm. I think LS is another great example because casting with him was very difficult at the beginning, but then became very easy once you learn his nuances. And I think that we've had, you know, some fantastic casts together. Some doozies, of course. Uh, there was a certain, you know, quarterfinal that was not so fun, but uh, that was that was another very eye-opening experience that I, you know, I was I was proud of where we got to. Mm. I, I always have felt the element that you've whoever you're casting with this this person seems to have such an easy time uh, like hmm. it's it, it's 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 as if um you seem very very aware of of who, of who you're casting with so what you're saying makes uh perfect sense really really yeah okay uh one of one of my favorites though um and i know this is probably not a thing that i should be talking about but there was one cast that I was very, very happy with. Mm. And it was with Jat. Worlds 2019? I Pro think it was 2019. Was it, was it in Europe? Yeah, it was in Europe. Yeah, then, yeah. then 2019. And we were, yeah, yeah, we were over there together. And that was probably one of my favorite days of casting I've had in a really long time. I spent the whole time trying to recruit him because this is, what, this is when Papa was leaving. Yeah, yeah, so it was definitely 2019. So mm. this is when Papa was leaving and I was just recruiting everyone to the LCK <laughs> and like that is like an underlying joke throughout like all of the games that we were casting and I don't know there was there was a really beautiful balance that was set um on that desk is what I felt the, I was just having such a great time um may not have translated it at all to any of the fans at home but I was very happy with with how that one went <laughs> but for some reason it rings a bell you know because I, I was I think I was on the analyst desk on that day Ah, cool. Because because it rings a bell. It it, it 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 what you're saying really really rings a bell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure anyway, other was, people had really that experience too. I'm sure other people had the same experience for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. That was a that was a good question though. Interesting question. Hard one to answer. Let's see what else we have here. I think I've got time for one more. Okay. Well then, I'm gonna just uh, ask something. <laughs> do do you play okay. po do you play Pokemon Go? I did, I did back. Because you, you day, seem yeah. like the perfect Pokemon Go player. I don't know why. Because <laughs> I, I, you, you, you fucking, you roll a blade, you, you, you have the whole Pokemon Go thing decked out. Why don't you play Pokemon? You play, you play Genshin Impact too. It's kind of the same thing, no? I mean, Genshin Impact, you don't have to walk around as much. Um, but also, Pokemon Go stopped working on my phone in Korea. Oh. Um, because Pokemon Go is based on Google Maps, and Google Maps is kind of broken in this country. It works I now. was playing because I was I was playing a lot when I first moved here, and then it's it was it was kind of working, but it sort of wasn't at the same time. Um, so I just sort of stopped. I, I became less interested. Plus, I'm like a huge Pokemon fan in general, mm. and so the fact that like a lot of the game systems are so dumbed down in Pokemon Go, it always left me wanting more. You okay. know, what I want is just to play more pokemon legends arceus because that game was just amazing mm. loved that, it that, that was, was enough the, that was the right amount of dumbing down is what i kind of thought okay now i've been playing pokemon go for so long like uh, it comes and goes in phases for sure but now i feel like the game is good now you know they've already oh, they've, shit. They've, they've made good adjustments really good adjustments there's always like an event going on there's community days and shit like that it makes me go outside mm. i kind of like it but nevertheless i should i should definitely get back in there Final thing, Atlas. Final thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start this tradition that I want you to ask a question to the next guest mm -hmm. I'm going to have on the show. Ooh, who's so, your next guest? I don't know. That's the fun part. So you can think of the That's most hard, profound thing ever. 
or the most simplest thing. Mm. It's like, how was your day? Anything, whatever comes to your mind. Okay, my question to mystery person is, what is the most important human invention to you in your everyday life? Mm. Okay. I think we just leave it at that. Yeah. Atlas, it's uh, been a pleasure, really. I feel like we could talk. Thank you so uh, much. I, forever. Yeah, I actually feel like uh, this this two and a half hours was not enough. Let's let's do it again. Maybe I could answer that question because it sounds like a fun question. <laughs> it just it just it's just our podcast now. Just you and yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I'll just come back. I'll just come. Look, can we do it tomorrow? Maybe tomorrow's fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. No, for sure. You're coming back. No, that's like the uh, it came to mind because I see you as a dear friend, and I was having a lot of conversations about how you know just. How important it is to to have positive positive interactions and every interaction I've ever had with you, as I mentioned before, has been just so genuine, you know. And they really well, stick it, out it, to it, me. You know? It's it's at least fifty percent you, my friend. At least fifty percent you. <laughs> You're too kind. It's You're too been kind. a joy. It's um, truly uh, it's been fun to to go down memory lane because a lot of shit just came back to me. You know, it's like those memories that are like yeah. deep within. It's like oh, like I know BCA, <laughs> all the stuff uh, back in San Francisco, and <laughs> yeah. we went to the end of the world and back so truly atlas uh, have a have a pleasant uh, night if you want uh, i give you the floor you want to promote something uh you want to say uh, something to your homies um no uh not 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 really um i i want to say thank you to everyone at the lck um for continuing to put up with me uh every single <laughs> year um a shout out to my fiance for being absolutely amazing and i love you so much and a shout out to you, my friend. Thank you so much for having me on. And it's just great to be able to sit down and have a chat. Thanks to technology for allowing us to do this. Okay. And hopefully I see you soon. All right. Gorgeous. All right, brother. I'm going to hang up. I'm going to say bye to these homies and thank people for subbing and all that jazz. And no worries, uh, I'll man. catch you guys on the other time. See you. All right. Bye see bye. you later, man. Holy. Ain't that something, guys? This was a lot of fun. And hopefully uh, we're going to have... Uh, we're going to have plenty more guests. Uh, a lot to dissect there. I need to listen back to it, you know. I feel like I could talk to, with Atlas uh, for a very long time. Uh, like, he's such a kind spirit. And a lot of the conversations we were having before, you know, on, on the podcast was just how, you know, positive thinking can, can really carry through and... Atlas is a very empathic person, it seems to be very in tune with himself, and I, I, I can genuinely say, really, I, I've never had an interaction with Atlas where I felt like, oh, this wasn't positive in any way or form, you know? And that is already, you know, insane. Let me VIP Atlas. That Atlas guy. Okay. Okay.